Good morning, and thank you for coming out so early for our conference. I'm Gladwin D'Souza with the Sierra Club, and we are happy to have you here today for our Peninsula Wildfire Summit. This summit is looking at the region starting from Hillsboro and going all the way down to Portola Valley. We're trying to look at that area in San Mateo County. Who hasn't heard about the misfortunes of paradise? Communities are burning all over California. The cost of property losses are threatening to bankrupt the state. And Governor Newsom has gotten directly involved. Nature has abandoned California as her favorite child. She's throwing fire and brimstone at us. Forests and prairies from the Amazon to the Arctic are burning. The president is calling for prayer. Our last governor said the climate is changing, and that's the new normal. Our first speaker tonight will address the changing climate and how we can respond to it. Our second speaker will tell us where the threats are coming from. The Sierra Club's motto is to enjoy, protect, and explore. I'm Gladwin D'Souza, chair of the Conservation Committee. Droughts, sea level rise, melting glaciers, floods, dried up rivers and lakes, and now fires, hell, even mosquitoes toting viruses like Zika are threatening us and the environment we look to protect. We are putting on summits like this in the hope that neighbors and politicians can get together and discuss solutions that will be useful to both of us. This summit is about a place called home. Is my home still safe? Is your home still safe? The lexicon is changing. We have a whole bunch of new words that we can throw at you, such as intrusion, ignition, fire nados, diablo winds, ember fires, house to house ignition, and yes, climate refugees, like we saw recently from paradise. This lexicon describes risks that didn't exist a decade ago. These risks are destroying communities and making it very difficult to get insurance. The lack of insurance is threatening our life savings in our homes. Our next three speakers will address risk reduction through issues related to home hardening, vegetation management, and ignition reduction. According to the University of Colorado, more than 90% of fires are started by humans. Intrusion is both a threat to our life savings and the lives of firefighters. You can see the intruded habitation patterns in our open space along the ridge lines. Intrusions infrastructure in the wildlands like roads, cars, and utility lines are part of the human fingerprint on these fires. In recent years, these wildfires have begun to take communities by surprise. In the recent Napa fire, people went to sleep in the old normal and woke up in the new normal because the fire started in the early hours of the morning. Our fifth speaker will talk about early detection and communication so that neighborhoods in the high fire zones can respond and not be taken by surprise. Should I get a battery backup when the power goes down? Our final speakers will discuss response from notification to evacuation and what role the community needs to play. We are all pressed to answer how we will get through this new normal with our neighbors and grandchildren. Nature has provided for generations. All she asked for in return was for us to be grounded to this planet. When you look at a tree, you see therapy for the distressed, shade for the heated, and shelter from the storm. Now, the way we live in and with nature is threatened. If we cannot care for our planet, this one place we call home, Nature wants to turn it over to the jellyfish and the ants. 
Ken Castle will close out this summit with a more general Q&A about your home in the new normal. Will rebuilding my fence and deck put me in danger? Who will tell the building department what I should be doing? If you haven't heard an answer to questions like that, write it down on the postcards that are going around. Paul over there is waving postcards and send them down the table and Paul will pick them up and give them to Karen to screen. You are saying, hey, your pants are on fire, but where are the bathrooms? You go out the door, come in the front, and walk past the elevators, and the bathrooms are over there. They're uh, ADA accessible. There's a button on the side you can push to open it. Otherwise, you've got to struggle and wrestle with the door. Thanks to Camille King, we have coffee and snacks over here. Which And thank you to the college for allowing us to bring it into the room and eat. Gloria Schultz and Paul Wendt will be helping pick up your questions as you send them down the rows. At the end of the conference, Ken will host an extensive Q&A with your questions. We thank the college for donating the room to the summit and Dan Belville for organizing it for us and John from IT for keeping us all together and on schedule. I also want to thank Sally Lieber and Josh Becker who are running for state senate and they're in the room here today. You can ask them questions at the end. Karen Markey and Ken Castle put our speaker list in this summit together. Karen is chair of our forest committee. She'll also be selecting the questions that you send down. So be nice to her and give her a big hand. Karen. I, I have a few um, opening comments about forests. Um, if we really want to reduce the number, the threat of wildfire, we need to take on climate change with a lot more vigor. We need to ramp up our efforts. Confronting climate change involves in reducing greenhouse gases and also increasing carbon sequestration. <coughs> The primary focus of the state government and PG&E for reducing wildfire risk has been to remove trees and underbrush. Removing trees and un trees always puts greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. It always eliminates sequestered carbon. Although fuel reduction may quiet the public's demand for safety, its fix is temporary and limited. Its effectiveness for reducing wildfire depends on where it's done and how it's done. In any case, it cannot provide the needed improvements to our infrastructure to better withstand the pressures we are facing. For example, fuel reduction does not enable a house to withstand an ember landing on its roof and not catching fire. Subta substantive and targeted means for making residents safer are available. Houses are, can be built with less flammable materials and be surrounded by defensible space. Old utility equipment can be upgraded and old bare wire distribution lines replaced by insulated wires or undergrounded. In 2019, PG&E plans to replace only 150 miles of bare wire with insulated wire and they plan to remove or trim thousands of miles of trees. Removing trees always releases greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and eliminate sequestered carbon. When deciding what to do to safeguard our communities, we must consider the effectiveness of the alternatives and their, the impact of their ability on, the, the impact on, their, on our ability to address climate change. And uh, Ken Cowles is going to introduce the first speaker. Thank you, Karen. Well, we're going to jump right into it, folks. Uh, um, I'm happy to say that we have uh, a great uh, panel of speakers today. We've covered uh, a lot of areas, and uh, I'm just going to jump right in uh, with introductions here. Our first speaker is going to focus on uh, the climate issues. Um, Dr. Craig Clements is a professor of meteorology and climate science at San Jose State. Um, I met him back in April when uh, his department hosted a fire weather research workshop. It was a day-long event. It was absolutely extraordinary because, to me, it, it drove home all the issues, all the things about climate and winds and how do fires behave that I hadn't heard before. And I just think it's great that, uh, that we have 
this resource right here in the Bay Area. And uh, further, uh, Dr. Clements has for several years um, been focusing on <coughs> different types of, of meteorological measurements, uh, and he has a mobile atmospheric uh, profiling system. This is a vehicle that goes out with his team uh, to some of the, the major fires around the state uh, to measure climate and wind conditions. And uh, so, uh, really, if, you, if you've heard of people who go out and look at tornadoes or hurricanes, uh, his team goes out and looks at these fires so we can try to understand them better. Um, so without further ado, um, Dr. Clements, please join us. Thanks, Ken, for the introduction. Thanks, everyone, for coming today, and thanks for allowing me to speak to you all. So I'm going to cover mostly uh, meteorology and how it affects fuels in the wildland fire environment. And so I'll kind of do a mix mash of uh, topics today in, in the 15 minutes that I have. Let's see. Oh, I don't know why I'm clicking it. Yeah, we'll just do that. Okay, so a little background on uh, my team. Uh, when I got to San Jose State in 2007, we established the Fire Weather Research Lab. We're the only academic program in the U.S. that focuses on uh, fire weather. And um, we do research on extreme fire behavior, fire weather, and fire danger. Uh, I also teach classes in three wildfire classes, one in fire weather, advanced fire weather, one in uh, GE, which is actually for non-majors, it's called wildfire systems, and then uh, some fire behavior classes. Um, I like to use this, I'm going to click right here, I'm going to drive. Um, the fire environment is, uh, well, the fire behavior triangle for review is basically we have fuels, which are the things that are burning, shrubs, trees, and grasses. The topography, which makes the fire behavior more extreme and faster in terms of fire spread. And then the weather, and I circle weather because it's the most variable of all these components. And so that's what I'm going to try to focus on today's talk. But for, I thought, kind of going into fire danger for the community, when we think of fire danger, what does that mean? And if you see the sign, if you go to the state parks, you always see Smokey the Bear with the, the paw pointing to the fire danger sign. How does, how does that sign get put up? How do we make that calculation? Well, it's actually part of a very large system called the NFDRS, or National Fire Danger Rating System. This is uh, two days ago, and this is impressive for September to be moderate and low in Northern California. So we're, we've had a, a lucky year. But this is how we calculate the danger in your community, is based on all those triangles. They make the calculation. It's a weather station. So fire danger is driven or calculated by the weather stations in the community. And so that's where that sign comes from. And if we look at the next slide here, so if we look at weather stations around the state, we have all these surface stations. So there's some areas we don't have as many because it's super complex terrain. We can't get something in there or it's on a different type of uh, land management. But this is what a weather station looks like. This is ours in Henry Co. State Park. There's satellite. It transmits the data once an hour to uh, the NFDRS system, bounces around through satellites, makes a calculation, and so we get a daily and hourly calculation of fire danger. Each weather station represents a region, so it's not as high resolution as it should be, but that's something that pg and is working on. All the utilities, all the IOUs are put investing into more weather stations so they can increase this the density of weather stations. This looks pretty dense for you all, but it's in terms of microclimates and micrometeorology, we tend to want more uh, sites. So something that we're building, this is our site up at, um, we call this uh, South Umminum. This is near Mount Umminum. This is one of our sites with Midpen uh, Regional Open Space, and we have a, there's a camera here for a Fire Safe Council. And this is our weather station in our field site where we actually do fuel sampling. We sample the fuels, which I'll talk about in just a bit. And so what we're doing is we're building a research grade network of fire weather stations. Instead of just having a tower somewhere, we're basically using these sites to do manual fuel sampling and testing new sensor arrays so we can get to the live fuel moisture component of the National Fire Danger Rating System. 
fuels are really important. We always worry about the winds. Of course, winds are very dangerous in terms of if there's ignition, but we really need to understand fuel moisture content, and I'll show you that next. So what we do, and this goes around all around the U.S., especially in California, twice a month, we manually go out and we clip the fuels. And in California, it's chemise. That's our, our main shrub type that we sample. And some, also some manzanita. So these are my grad students. And what you see here is the trends or the actual calculations. So we, we, take, we clip it, we put them in cans, we weigh them, dry them, weigh them again, we get the moisture content. And that goes into the National Fuels Database. And it's quite, impre it's quite important com uh, component of fire danger. How dry are the fuels? <coughs> well, we make calculations for the dead fuels using the weather stations, but we don't have a good model for the f uh, fuel moisture, the live fuels, the living shrubs. There's a few models coming out in the utilities. They're contracting uh, researchers, developing new fuel mo live fuel mo model moist live mo fuel moisture models but um, we still are doing it manually. Look at this. So this is the uh, minimum, the red line. The green is the average, and this is 2019. We've been, all summer, we have been 10 to 20% above normal. That's been great. And that's a, uh, associated with the late rain that we had in May and the high precipitation that we had over the uh, winter and spring. But look what happened. We get to fall, and we always get back down to a minimum. And that's because these shrub types, they can become more dormant, and they've, it's been a longer time period since they've actually had precipitation. Chemise respond about 25 days to rain. And so uh, there's a slight uptick end of May when we had some rain mid-May. But we didn't see it at all sites. But this has really been the reason why we've had such a um, Non-impressive fire season. It basically, Cal Fire is, all the fire agencies are knocking everything down real quick. So lots of ignitions, but they're not getting big. But now we're getting back into our fall fire season and fall conditions. So that's an important component of the fire behavior triangle is the fuel and the fuel moisture content and how weather drives that is something that we're looking into and something that we need to continue by adding more weather stations, enhancing our networks, and uh, developing better models, and I'll show you some examples of models later. So I want to go into Diablo Winds. I was at, Ken kind of gave me the uh, kind of the format of what he wanted me to talk about so to this audience. And so one thing was Diablo Winds. We've been hearing about him on the news a lot. I've had a student that published her thesis in 2018 on um, simulating and calculating what a Diablo Wind is. The meteorological community is jumping on this because nobody had heard about it until uh, October 8th, so 2017. So now uh, you'll be hearing about the Diablo win more and more. Um, so what we did, or what Carrie did, is she took, she limited her study to the Bay Area and calculated a 17-year climatology using 42 uh, NWS stations and remote automated weather stations. And so the frequency is the color on the dot. So it's, it's a small figure. Sorry, you probably can't see it back there. But what we defined it as six meters per second, so that's about 13 miles an hour sustained for six hours um, from the northeast. That's a long period of that wind. It's not very strong, but that's a pretty long time to have that corridor of winds coming from the northeast. And you had to have uh, humidity less than 20 percent. So, you know, people are jumping around with these kind of classifications. And so we identified 43 events with that criteria in that 17-year period. So a couple events per year. Oh, oh, sorry. And so uh, on average, two and a half events occur in Northern California or in the Bay Area. Um, but what I really want to focus on is that live fuel moisture. This may be hard for you to see in the back, but this dashed line here is live fuel moisture content, average from s the sites in the Bay Area, calculated the same way I just mentioned. We get down in the fall, here it is again, dropping to its minimum. But the frequency of these Diablo winds is highest in October. Okay, or sorry, so yeah, October and November. So we have the strongest winds, the driest winds occur at the same time we have the most minimum fuel moisture. So even though we've had a pretty benign fire season here in Northern California, we aren't out of it yet. Maybe this precipitation forecast next week will help us out if it does uh, persist or if we get enough rain. 
Um, that's pretty unusual in the last few years. We haven't had a two potential rain days in mid-September. Anyway, so this is, our this is our critical fire weather pattern. Low fuel moisture content because of the uh, ecology of the chaparral ecosystem and climate and the fact that we have climatologically our highest winds in the fall. So Kerry did a uh, simula numerical simulation of the high resolution uh, weather model called WARF and this is the uh, Tubbs fire and the weather conditions with the Tubbs fire. Zero is Coffee Park, this is Mount St. Helena and what you're going to see is blues are winds um, negative, reds are from right to left and there's a hydraulic jump. This is a downslope windstorm and so that's why these winds are so strong at the surface is because we get a, a, a a weather system set up that forces the wind down on the east side of that terrain. Same thing happens in the Sierra Nevada on both sides, depending on the, what the wind direction is. But this is what a Diablo wind is. It's called downslope windstorm. And it occurs when we have stable atmosphere above the terrain or at terrain high, and it forces the air through. And because of the dynamics, it hits the surface here and continues. And then right about 3 a.m., local time, you'll see that the wind lifts off the surface. It's the same time that the fire plumes kind of stood up had already kind of stopped progressing through Coffee Park. Um, so we're trying to, we tried to highlight the mechanics of that wind system. Okay, so that was that hydraulic jump. I'll let you sh see it again if it, come on. But you'll see it. Where the, wi where the reds come down, that's winds from Right to left, right there, where the blue was, that was a jump in the flow, just like flow behind a rock. You see the flow come down, and it becomes an equilibrium of the same height up upstream of the rock. And so, basically, 3 a.m. is the time when the fire spread stops mo progressing at a high rate of spread, and it was um, the same time we simulated where that wind detached from the surface. So what about this area? If we look at that, uh, the overall average or climatological average of winds, I know this is hard to see from the back. This is the only figure I could find. We don't have the strongest Diablo winds here in the peninsula, in the mountains here. But we do have them. So this is a synoptic composite. So this is basically taking all the cases, averaging them, and then calculate taking 43 cases and taking the average dew point and wind direction. So we do get them here. What's interesting is that when you get these winds that come off the Sierra, northern Sierra, and into the coastal ranges north of uh, San Francisco, the Napa area, we also have a very strong northerly flow in the Central Valley. And they're linked together. But this isn't where we get the strongest Diablos because the train here is not as tall and we're, up, we're on upwind train. So the winds are impacting the terrain. It's on the lee side where you get the strongest winds. But we haven't really diagnosed that in much detail. Okay, so what happens at the surface? This is one minute average weather data from our mobile lab. And this is a uh, onset of a Santa Ana wind event. And so if you're at the coast, which my students were when they collected these data, temperature's 55 degrees Fahrenheit, the blue line. Relative humidity is about 90%, so pretty foggy. It's typical coastal California conditions. Winds are about, this is meters per second, so just double it roughly, so about two miles an hour, so that's nothing. You can see the, hash, the hashes here, that's the winds that are very variable, so the wind sensor's just moving this way, and then the next minute it might move that way, and it's not really doing anything. Once the winds hit the surface, we have an average of like 18 miles an hour, gusting to 25, dead easterly, northeasterly. Look at the temperature. The humidity tanks down to 15% uh, in just a matter of minutes. So if you're standing here, you didn't know that there was going to be a Santa Ana wind event. Just an hour later, you're in the, in the full brunt of it. So how does this work? What happens is we have the winds mixed down. So this is uh, wind speed moving, again, right to left. And so what happens over time, the, the highest winds, which are the strongest colors, green being zero at the surface of that, where that weather station is. This is a Doppler LIDAR. It's like a laser-based radar. It measures winds. So it's scanning through the atmosphere. And it detected the winds before it was at the surface. And so this is what happens. 
The winds are much stronger aloft, and then they mix down to the surface very quickly. So with that said, what I've been proposing for a number of years now is that we need a wind profiling network throughout the state for fire danger. And nobody's jumped on it yet. The, si the state of New York has 20 Doppler LiDAR wind profilers in their state. And they don't have the right conditions for those systems to even work because they use them for air pollution. New York's a lot cleaner than here. These, this network, if we focused on certain corridors, would really help help us identify these wind systems when they move down, especially in wind corridors, because fire danger is actually also a function of wind. So if you, have, if you live in a very windy area, you're going to have higher uh, fire danger than if you don't. And we're talking microclimate, micrometeorology. So the winds could be really strong at your house, but not so strong at your house. And so understanding these is uh, variability. The variability in these winds is important. Okay. So, as Ken mentioned, we operate a couple of mobile systems now. This is the only mobile atmospheric profiling system in the U.S. that is tuned for wildfire. It has Doppler LiDAR, some other instruments. We have communications, radio so We launch weather balloons from this. And um, another thing for you that, that I wanted to point out is that our team is all fireline qualified through the Tahoe National Forest. Everybody's red carded as FF2. So we go through our pack test every year, and we're able to uh, be deployed. So just a couple of final slides. How am I doing on time? A few couple more minutes? OK, perfect. Uh, one thing that's new is our new uh, cloud radar. This is a specially designed uh, Doppler radar. It's the only mobile radar in the western US, besides the news crews. And uh, it's specifically tuned for uh, fire plumes. And so now we can peer into very large plumes and understand what's going on inside, because it's really hard to understand what's going on inside the fire. How strong are the updrafts? where are the winds uh, moving embers, and we're hoping to be able to detect ember cast with this system because of its wavelength. And the advantage of this thing is that it's really, really fast. So it has a scan rate of 20, 20 degrees per second, so we can cover a real uh, large area. And we can do volumetric scans, so it's an advanced system. We're we're just building the hydraulic system. It should be ready next week. So with these tools, we're able to collect data that we can now use to tune the next generation fire behavior model, which are coupled atmosphere models. So this is the French national fire model. And so what you're seeing here is a combustion code running with a weather model. And the heat from the combustion is being pushed into the weather model. And the weather model is responding to that heat and driving the fire properly. Because what we've shown, my colleagues have shown, is that if you don't link the fire model to the atmosphere, it won't work. So lots of models out there that are being run um, do not do this. And people are buying into those models. And it's, phys you know, you might be getting the right answer for the wrong reason. But as a scientist, we want the physics right so we can actually understand that this is what's driving it. So th those colors are all sorts of like updrafts and stuff. If we look at a larger scale model, this is a, a simulation of a much larger fire. And you can see that the plume is generating updrafts. The fire spread is moving. And this is the Los Conscious fire in 2011. And so these models can be run in real time and the Warfest fire system is something that we're porting at San Jose State, point and click. And it runs on either the cloud or HPC, High Performance Computing Center. OK. And then finally, this is a, a, a new m model called uh, from Technosilva. They run all the fire danger models for cities. And it's the, probably the most advanced model. It's, they're pulling in the coupling in the next uh, few months. But uh, they have an empirical spotting model. and. Uh, Finally, this is, I mean, many cities use this modeling tool, and uh, CAL FIRE uses it in the utilities. So anyways, this is kind of the state of the science right now, what's going on, are these coupled models and then these spread models. So with that, Daryl. Thanks. Thank you, Craig. A lot in the whole climate picture, and, it, and it's still an evolving science. Um, our next uh, speaker is going to address 
uh, some of the critical things that are important to us. What are the threats in San Mateo County and, the, and on the peninsula? So uh, Jonathan Cox wears two hats, or maybe two helmets. Uh, he is the division chief for the CAL FIRE, uh, which covers San Mateo and I believe Santa Cruz counties. And he's also the fire chief for San Mateo County. So um, he has uh, lengthy experience uh, with CAL FIRE. Um, he's responded to a number of the major disasters around the state. Uh, he's a member of the CAL FIRE incident management team and he serves on the command staff in the capacity um, of uh, public information officer. Uh, he holds a bachelor's degree from Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo, a master's from University of Copenhagen, Denmark, and has completed intensive training uh, at the United Nations Institute for Training and Research in Geneva, Switzerland. So uh, he's gonna talk to us about uh, what we face in our backyard. So introduce uh, Jonathan Cox. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Sierra Club. Uh, and most importantly, thank you, everybody, for coming out on your Saturday morning and uh, spending it with us. Uh, maybe a show of hands. I'd like to just hear Dr. Clement keep on speaking and so I don't have to speak because that's uh, <laughs> fascinating stuff and so important to what we do. Uh, as Ken said, my name is Jonathan Cox, uh, Division Chief for CAL FIRE here locally in San Mateo County. Uh, and I'm here to talk about kind of what's going on uh, locally and statewide when it comes to fires. So, I'll, excuse me, I'll come over here. Um, is there another presentation, Ken? Because this is the second one. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> there, there's a camera rolling, Dan. I know better than that. <laughs> Perfect, that's great. All right, we'll get started. So uh, just to kind of put things in perspective, we talk about this new normal and, and what's going on across the state of California. I've had the unfortunate experience over the last three years to have been a part of uh, the Valley Fire, the Tubbs Fire, the Car Fire, the Paradise Fires, uh, and kind of continued to see insights into what's going on across the state of California and what this new normal looks like. Uh, I think maybe the starkest numbers we can look at are last year and how many fires burned uh, and how many structures were destroyed. And this number right here of 22,000 structures and over 100 people being killed by fire in California in 2018 is probably the biggest thing to always keep in mind. The reason I start here is because the most important thing to recognize in all of this is California is prone to fire. It's a natural process. And I think that gets lost a lot of times in the conversation is, uh, long before Cal uh, um, uh, uh, Western civilization was here, we were getting fire occurring every 30 to 50 years on the lands that we currently habitate. So fire is a natural process and important to keep in mind as we go through all of this. So with that, what is this new normal? What is kind of going on in the state of California right now? Uh, well, there's, there's an equation that looks at all this, and it's really three components to it. And we're going to talk a lot today about climate change, some really uh, 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 important experts here to talk about this. Uh, but there's also the human impact of what's going on across the state right now. Uh, and you combine the climate change with the human impacts and you get this new normal of what's going on across the state. Um, and this has everything to do from weather to vegetation uh, to the length of fire season, uh, how we put out fires, where we live, and how we build our infrastructure. Uh, and that all results in this issue of more fires, more deadly, more often. And that's kind of the downer of all of this, is this is our predicament right now. We're sitting in this equation, uh, and it's kind of coming to light over the past uh, three years after about a 100 years worth of, of change. So the kind of core of all this is the weather. Uh, the climate is changing. There's no denying that. And the last five years have been the hottest uh, uh, temperatures on record across the state of California. For us as firefighters, the thing that gets us really concerned is the nighttime temperature change that we're seeing. Uh, the mean average nighttime temperature has been increasing over the last three years, and that has a big impact on our fire behavior during the day, as well as our suppression efforts during the night, our fuel moisture recoveries, and the way we're actually able to contain these fires. So there's a direct impact on the daily operations when it comes to the climate, 
and there's also a long-term implication because of the longer heating years uh, and the increased temperatures. Kind of with that climate change problem comes a claim, uh, change in vegetation. So we're trying to see the vegetation actually change across the state as well. Uh, and one thing that you may not realize is there's a huge tree mortality problem in the state of California right now. Uh, if anyone wants to take a guess on how many dead or dying trees there are in the state? Millions, Millions yeah. 1.29 1, 1 million is the last figure we got for uh, tree mortality. Over the last two years, uh, the state has been able to um, uh, remove uh, uh, about a s a f one sixtieth of that. So uh, even if we continue on this path, it's 60 plus years before we actually fully uh, get our hands around this tree mortality problem. But obviously dead or dying trees poses a direct risk both to, to, to landowners, but more importantly to the public and the people who live on them. The next component of all this is kind of the average acres burned and the, the way that fires uh, uh, and fire season is extending. So if you look at the green here, this is the 1984 to 2000. Um, this is average acres burned across California. And you can see uh, it kind of used to be very uh, kind of top heavy in the middle of the to late summer and fall and then die off towards the end of the year. The red is 2001 to 2018, and you can see almost a doubling of the fire uh, acreage that's burned across the state. And kind of most importantly is the end of the year, the September, October months, the, the fall that Dr. Clint was talking about uh, being the most active. Uh, the result of this is what we consider kind of defined fire season is about 80 days longer now than it was 10 years ago. So the trend is with the changing climate and changing vegetation, the changing weather conditions, the result is our fire season is getting longer. Uh, a lot of times you hear year-round fire season, and that's not out of the question when you're getting the Thomas fires burning in, in December and January. So to kind of put this all into uh, perspective, I just wanted to play a really quick video. I think they say don't play videos in your PowerPoints, right? So this, I just want to keep an eye on right here. This is the start of the campfire. The time is about 6.30 in the morning. And this is just a progression map. So uh, the town of Paradise, uh, right up, basically right there. Uh, this is obviously a, a simulation after the fact. Uh, we're just after noon right now. This is the city of Chico right here. The yellow is just progressing. It's the fire front basically coming down there. Uh, right now we're about 5 p.m., uh, 7 p.m. right now. And before 9 o'clock it actually gets down to Highway, uh, I think it's Highway 70 or 99, which is the one that comes into Chico right there. The thing to recognize about this, as with all fires that we've seen in the last year, is the first 12 hours after that fire ignites is when the destruction is being done. Um, these are fast-moving fires that are consuming large amounts of area in a very short amount of time. Uh, and that's all coming back to this idea of wind-driven fires that are really based on the weather. Uh, there we go. So Dr. Clement hit on it a lot. The weather topography and the fuels are, um, uh, are the triangle. And maybe most importantly is this idea that the red flag warnings have a lot of uh, meaning in California right now. And I think a lot of the public are really starting to understand that when the conditions are right for dry fuel moistures uh <coughs> and some wind and hot temperatures, you get this idea of a red flag warning. Uh, we got an email this morning saying that there was a red flag warning up in the Sierras right now. So these we, we can, with some degree understand when some of the most vulnerable times are for fires uh, in the state of California. The good news is living here in San Mateo County, we are probably one of the few counties that have the lowest number of red flag warnings anywhere in the state. Um, <coughs> that's predominantly due to our coastal influence of the, um, of the fog as well as our, our really uh, dense uh, redwood forests. But we do get them, uh, especially the zones up on the ridge line down towards Santa Cruz County. Uh, we get them occasionally. This far inland and, and up north, we've seen about two in the last 10 years. Uh, but the, the thing that concerns me is that we have a false sense of security that we don't get them because we do get them occasionally. And when those conditions are present, we really have the opportunity here to uh, have a devastating fire. So I'm going to show you one more video. 
this is the car fire up in Reading last year. I can uh, commentate it a little bit. So that was the car fire you may have remembered from last year up in Reading, and that was actually a tornado, an F3 tornado that came through the fire into the city of Reading, the largest uh, recorded tornado ever to occur during a fire in the United States. Uh, it destroyed a lot of structures, it killed multiple people, including some firefighters, uh, and again, it was kind of one of those climactic um, statistical anomalies that all came together at the wrong times across the state. Just some interesting things to look at when it comes to wind. That's a metal pole right there uh, wrapped around uh, a post in the city of Reading. Uh, this is the progression of the actual tornado itself where it trapped three of our dozer operators and killed a firefighter in the city of Reading. Uh, and kind of the, the takeaway from all of this is uh, the weather I keep coming back to is one of the outliers that as it gets more extreme, we're seeing more extreme conditions on the ground uh, as firefighters. Uh, kind of one anecdotal story to it all, the rate of spread that we saw in the city of Santa Rosa, uh, uh, there was an actually identical fire called the Hanley Fire in 1964 in Santa Rosa. Almost the identical uh, uh, footprint to the, to the Tubbs Fire. It took four and a half days to burn what the Tubbs Fire burned in three and a half hours. Uh, that's the change we're seeing over the last hundred years. A hundred years ago, we uh, lost less than a uh, hundred structures, cabins at that time. Uh, or sorry, 40, 50 years later, we've lost over 5,000 structures in the same footprint. So uh, that's just a good example of the culmination of this all coming together. I know I'm out of time, and I'll wrap up. I'm going to be back up here. Um, so just one thing that I will follow up with is kind of the outlook moving forward for San Mateo County, because everything is uh, obviously local. And Dan may be hitting on this later. There's an um, uh, Office of Sustainability is looking at what does the next 50 to 100 years look like in San Mateo County. Uh, the worst case scenario in this county is some extreme conditions presenting themselves that we see in other parts of the state. So uh, like more like Southern California where we have the coastal influence diminishing, the fog line going down, uh, and obviously the fuel moisture going down along with it. Uh, the best case scenario, uh, or the historic average, has us uh, looking somewhat the same, maybe a little bit worse. Um, but the good scenario uh, has a pretty big outlier on the coast showing that we have some potential uh, big changes coming our way as, as it relates to the way fire may impact San Mateo County. Uh, so I'm going to wrap it here. I'm going to speak again a little bit at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, great. From the San Francisco Chronicle. Yeah. If yeah, the weather disparity. 
Yeah, if you want to look at that, Lizzie Johnson from the San Francisco Chronicle did an amazing story on this called 150 Minutes of Hell, uh, and it really dic uh, shows that, uh, all of that. I will say this really quick, Ken, because you asked me to specifically hit on it. Everyone already asks, what causes these fires? Uh, and how do they start? Can we stop the ignition problem? Uh, looking at the numbers, 80 to 95% of all fires are human-related, and human-related can be everything from vehicle fires to um, uh, throwing cigarettes out the window to campfires to uh, soldering a fence in the middle of a field. Uh, it, it covers the spectrum. About 9% is utilities, about 9% is car fires, and then the rest is uh, the whole gamut of what, of what humans actually do. Uh, so there's no single specific cause other than us. It's a human ignition problem more than anything else. So thank you, Ken. I'll be back. Thank you, Jonathan. So uh, moving to our next speaker, so we've heard about the issues with climate. We've heard about what causes these fires, how quickly they can spread. Uh, now we're going to talk about what can homeowners do, what can what cities, counties, other jurisdictions do to uh, address this, to make buildings less vulnerable. So uh, I'm really happy to have uh, Denise Anio, uh, Ania here, who is the fire marshal for uh, Woodside. It's the Woodside Fire Protection District, and she's responsible for fire code enforcement, fire and life safety prevention, education activities, and fire investigations. Uh, Woodside, by the way, has, uh, according to some statistics, the highest percentage of residents living in the very high fire hazard zone uh, in San Mateo County, about 33 percent or 32 percent. So uh, they've had a lot of experience in, in doing preparations, doing evacuation drills, coming up with evacuation plans, which are listed on the, on the town website. So uh, Denise is also the chair of the Fire Safe San Mateo County Council, uh, which is an umbrella organization of various agencies, fire departments, parks departments, water departments, utilities, uh, homeowners, um, a lot of people, myself included, have been joining these meetings in the last 10 months. It's been a real eye-opener for me. So without further ado, I'm going to present uh, Denise and Nia. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. All right. Uh, I think we're running short on time, and I have a lot of slides, so this is going to be quick. Uh, I will stick around after if you have any questions for me. Um, I'm, I'm happy to stay. So we've talked a lot about vegetation. Um, we're going to talk about home hardening. Um, so for generations now, we've been building uh, structures that have been built to burn uh, instead of building them to resist. Uh, our fire codes, uh, our contracts, that are our architects, aesthetically how we perceive having a house, um, we tend to you know, revert to building them with wood and combustible materials. Um, but that needs to change. We need to change the paradigm. So um, how do houses actually ignite? Um, the main reasons, uh, there's seven, and only one of them really revolves around vegetation. The other six are how our structures are built and the materials uh, that they're built with. And we're going to talk about each of the building components. So um, how they actually ignite, really three different methods. Uh, direct flame impingement, radiant heat, and of course, um, those nasty embers. So radiant heat um, can be from a vegetation fire, can be from a structure close to you, and it's the heat, the thousands of degrees potentially, uh, that is uh, created and the vegetation or your structure all has an ignition point. Everything has an ignition temperature. And that's what radiant heat is. When those items on your house or the vegetation around your house reaches that temperature, it ignites. Direct flame impingement is pretty obvious. It's when the flame actually comes in contact with the uh, combustible material. Embers and firebrands, uh, Dr. Clements talked about that a little bit, um, but they're really hard to figure out how many will there be uh, what, t what size will they be? How far will they travel? Um, Firebrands can be from vegetation or they can be from structure material themselves, uh, any wood product, anything that is burning and is lofted up into the air and can travel for miles, potentially. 
So the most likely cause for us um, is likely going to be firebrand and ember exposure. So, and there's going to be thousands and millions. And just like leaves in a, in a windstorm, they're all going to collect at the base of your structure, base of your fences, anywhere where there's something that can, can stop them and they can accumulate. So I, I posted some arrows here. Um, these are obviously a few different structures that are on fire. Um, so right here, this is likely a wood fence. And so the embers have stopped here and are collecting at the wood fence. So they're probably igniting the fence. This is a, a obviously a, a home. This could be mulch. This could be plant material. This could be wood siding that's just starting. But you can see in this in this slide all the all the starts. So what do we need to focus on? Here are the six. And and I know it's overwhelming because this is our entire house. <laughs> so the most important. In my mind, and I think in most fire officials' minds, uh, are the, is the roof. It's the highest. It's where every th all these embers, uh, they're going to loft into the air, and they're going to land first uh, on our roof. And so what kind of materials we have on our roof is very important. Um, maintenance, obviously, is very important when it comes to wildfire resiliency. So a couple of things I, I'd like you to look at here and pay attention to is these hips, uh, on the roof and the valleys are collection points. Um, so this could be a non-combustible roof. I can't really tell from the photo, but this right here is wood shake uh, siding, probably cedar siding. These are all leaves that are all combustible. These embers will loft, land on the leaves, and then ignite the wood siding. So um, the valleys are the same way. Everything has to be uh, non-combustible on your roof, or at least fire resistant. And then there is a maintenance component. So tile roofs, people think, oh, have a tile roof. It's not a problem. Well, installation is very important. So um, this right here, there's something missing here. And it's called a bird stop. And it's usually a piece of uh, a concrete that's in there to, to stop the birds uh, and rodents from nesting. So this is all nesting material. Embers uh, are in there and light your, your underneath of your tile roof on fire. So you're not out of the woods just because you have a tile roof. Uh, maintenance, uh, I, I, I can't emphasize it enough. Um, and, and the materials. This is actually a fire in my, in my district uh, years ago. And I, I can't tell you how many fire brands were lofted from this wood shake roof. It, it's, it, it's incredibly impressive. Okay, so number two, vents. You probably have all, uh, you know, if you've been studying uh, wildfire resiliency, have heard about the vents, the vents. Um, and there's lots of different types of vents on our house. There's attic vents, roof vents, uh, gable vents, E vents. So what happens is the screen, uh, and I have lots of samples over here, folks, so please go to my little table and, uh, and, and check them out, um, have a screen. And right now, the code is uh, 1 8 inch for the screen. The problem with that, that's a state code. And I know everybody's following the state code. The problem is the state code isn't quite working. Those, d <laughs> those darn embers are getting through. And um, this is actual um, embers coming through into the attic. And probably most of our attics look like this. So our attics are very compostable. The, the embers are getting in. The fire passes. And then our attics catch on fire two or three hours later from the embers. So vents are almost as important as your roof. Uh, I th these are just different kinds of roof. This is called uh, an eyebrow vent, and this is on your roof. So if the screening in here will allow embers, your, your underneath of your roof will be on fire. This is a foundation vent. So these are just, this is just leaf litter. And this is low, this is probably all concrete right here, but this is an access point to underneath your house. Uh, those are called bird hole vents. We call them bird hole vents because birds love to build their nests in there. Um, and there's things that you can do to prevent ember intrusion. Lots of new technology. A uh, picture of a gable uh, vent. These are usually on the side of our house and they're usually very, very large. On the left here, these are the, that, this is the new technology. Uh, I don't know if some of you have maybe heard Vulcan, Brandguard. They work. 
<laughs> they really, really do work. Oh, doors. So um, one hour door. This big solid wood door here, this is a stucco construction and it looks like radiant heat uh, from a fire really did some damage, but it didn't enter the structure. Pet doors. And nobody really thinks about your pet door, but this is probably just a plastic swinging door. We likely will have a wind event during a wildfire. The wind pushes the little door open and all those embers go, go inside. A potential a retrofit could be the magnetic locking doors. Something that maybe people don't think about, but a lot of people have. Fences. Everybody has a wood fence. Almost everybody has a wood fence. Well, anything that's combustible that's attached to your structure is a wick. So these people have done a really great job. They have, you know, non-combustible rock here, beautiful rock here. Th they're doing great. Uh, but this right here can get going, and if there's windows or something like that, it's a potential vulnerability to the house. Um, windows. We, a lot of us here in the hills have beautiful views. We have big plate glass windows. This bush alone is probably enough if this was a single pane or even a, a double pane window to compromise the window. So is it really worth it to have this one bush here and lose your entire house? Skylights. So a lot of us have skylights. A lot of us have plastic skylights. So guess what? The embers fall on the roof, melt the plastic skylight, embers are down inside of our house. So make sure if, you're, if you have skylights, um, retrofit them, tempered glass, have a metal mesh screen. If you have operable skylights, very important. You have to keep the embers out. Decks. So I want to say a quarter of uh, Bay Area residents have wood decks. We all have redwood decks. And that's a generational uh, material that we've used. Um, again, maintenance, storing anything under your wood deck is a no-no. Um, it's really difficult, once you have a wood deck, how do you stop embers from igniting your wood deck? You really can't. So the most important thing is how is the deck attached to the house? Is there flashing? Is there something non-combustible uh, on the side of your house so that when your deck potentially catches fire, is it also going to catch your house on fire? Vegetation around the deck. This, uh, this deck and likely this house does not have a chance. Just not going to survive. Trellis. Uh, a lot of us see this lightweight and use this lightweight trellis. It's very, very volatile. It's, it's lightweight, easy to burn. Uh, a lot of us try to hide things with vines attached to our house. Embers get stuck in here. And there's, there's dead uh, material in there, dead vegetation that's died over the years. And it gets going in there. Little nests are built in there. So it's the small things. You know, embers are small. Uh, they light small fires, but those small things um, become big, big fires. Wood siding. Um, this is actually in my jurisdiction. And this is just cedar shingle siding. And it goes all the way to the ground. And this is all leaf litter uh, and mulch. Uh, this tree. You know, you can see it's very close to the siding, so the tree catches on fire, uh, the retaining wall catches on fire. All these things are combustible, and they will burn. So uh, some people just have to have wood siding on the house. It's, it's very attractive, and they really like it. But if you want to have the wood siding, think about doing some sort of non-combustible skirting. Um, be careful where you do planting. Um, mulch, it burns too. A lot of people ask me, oh, well, it, it can't burn. It's just, it's mulch. Buy it at Linkso. It's, it's good for my plants. Well, it, it burns really well. And so what you don't want to do is create a wick of anything to get to your house. So this is just a summary. Those are the, the s really the six basic um, points on your house that you really need to recognize and take a second look at. I created and uh, left homework for you guys in the back on the table. 
and it's an assessment. And you can walk around your house when you get home today and you can assess your own house. Thanks, everyone. Brian Nowicki is the uh, California Climate Policy Director at the Center for B the Biological Diversity's Climate Law Institute. I he's based in Sacramento, where he works on state climate policy, including forest management and fire issues. Brian received his Master of Science in Forestry at Northern Arizona University before joining the center in 2002. Before moving to Sacramento, Brian worked as a conservation biologist in the center's national forest program advocating for environmental values and wildlife habitat and the U.S. Forest Service logging projects and vegetation management. Brian, thank you. And thank you very much for having me today. Um, good morning. Um, and, and thank you, uh, Karen and Ken, for, for inviting me. Um, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to do a lot of these talks, but I live and work in Sacramento. So most of the time, the folks that I'm talking about are talking about state level policy and um, don't get a chance to talk about the, the nuts and bolts so much as we have out here. Um, I always love being in a, in, in, in a conference in a situation where we have the we have fire, fire marshals and firefighters there because, well, number one, because they do all the heavy lifting and get all of the information out, the great information out, and secondly, because they want to focus on, they want to focus on fires and the fire risk to houses and how to protect those houses and people, whereas in Sacramento, so often, and I deal with the state policy level, um, it's about cutting trees in the Sierras. Um, it doesn't matter where you are, Santa Rosa or San Mateo, um, somehow the policies keep coming back to cutting trees in the Sierra Nevada. And um, I have the privilege today of being the tree hugger here to present um, kind of what's happening with policy and where we are. I work with the Center for Biological Diversity. Um, but like I said, in Sacramento, one of the, m the main group that I um, um, work shoulder to shoulder with on these issues is Sierra Club California. It's with Catherine Phillips and her, and her crew in, 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 Cal in Sacramento, where we're going in at the state policy level and trying to make the case um, for trees and get the focus back on fires and away from the, the logging and thinning that is, that is driving so much of this. So taking that as the, the here's, here's a pitch that we have been giving to the policy folks in, in, the, in the top levels of the state government. So here, while wildfire is inevitable, the loss of lives and homes is not. For houses to burn, they must catch fire. As there's three ways for a house to catch fire. Direct contact from flames, from the vegetation immediately adjacent to it. Radiating heat from the surrounding vegetation, forest, or from neighboring homes. And third, from embers and firebrands. So here we have a picture, uh, an aerial photo of paradise immediately after the campfire. And a few things that um, I see when I look at this is, number one, we have a fire break, a network of fire breaks that run through the entire town. And number two, there are still trees with green leaves, um, with green needles in the town after those, um, after those uh, fire has gone through. Here we go, Kilcree Circle, I believe. Yes, also in Paradise. All around this neighborhood, you see there is green leaves, green needles, still on these trees. This was not a crown fire. It's not a catastrophic crown fire that came roaring through in order to take out these houses. They were, they were ignited by something else. Now, once the fire got started, it could have gone from house to house, where each, um, each house is ignited from the radiant heat of, of right next door. But the way that this got started, like so many of the other um, examples I'm going to show you um, are by the flying embers and firebrands that we've already heard, we've already heard about. Here's another, here's another example um, at Paradise Circle, I believe. And, um, and here again, I just want to point out, not only do we see that there are still um, green needles on the trees, even though all of the houses have been burned, 
um, but we also see it was not a creeping um, ground fire, surface fire that took this out either. You can see that there's green grass still, not to mention that network of, um, of paths and roads that serve as fire breaks. Could not get more clear than this. Here we're at Ripley Valley near Santa Rosa. This is a house that was surrounded by agricultural field. This was this was not a, this was not a creeping crown fire. This was or this was not a raging crown fire. This was not a creeping surface fire. This had a effectively a fire break all the way around it, and it still caught fire and burned. What's the point of all of this? One last one, just to point out here. Almost certainly, you see how closely these are. Now these were mobile homes, but you see how close they were. So almost certainly, once any one got ignited, it would go to the be able to go to the next. But here, and I'm sorry you can't see it p terribly well, here's a pretty good spot. You can see that the trees here are burned. But they're burned from below. You see the lower branches are blackened and the upper branches are green, indicating that it was the houses that burned the trees, not the trees that burned the houses. This gets a pretty good reaction when I'm, we're in the Capitol and we're presenting this because what we're trying to say is, what do we need to do to actually protect houses and communities? That, that even though wildfire is inev inevitable, the loss of lives and homes is not. So what should we be doing to protect, protect those lives and houses? Well, we need to stop putting people in harm's way by building in fire-prone landscapes, which we continue to do um, today throughout California. We need to retrofit those homes that are already on the landscapes and we need to protect houses and communities by treating those houses themselves and the areas directly around them, not by cutting trees and shrubs far away from communities. We've already been through this. Denise covered it extremely well, all the things you can be doing around your home and how we protect houses themselves. So I'm not gonna repeat any of that, but um, I, the point that we have been making, the secondary point is, that fuel breaks out in the forest do not protect against the large wind-driven fires that we're seeing are result in the greatest loss of lives and homes. That is extreme fire weather. The hot, dry, windy conditions is the cause of the large fires. It's what's driving those large fires that move fast and result in the loss of homes and lives. It's not the fuels. That is, the fuels aren't the predictor. Let me say that again. It's not the fuels that can cause or predict the large fires. It's the extreme fire weather, which is exactly the conditions, of course, that we're seeing more and more under climate change. All right, so that's exactly what we've seen time and again. Here we are in the Tubbs fire. And uh, oh, I'm sorry, here we see time again in the Tubbs fire, the Thomas fire, the Woolsey fire, just to name some of the recent ones, which burned overwhelmingly, not in forest, but in grassland and chaparral. And here we see the northeast corner of the Santa Rosa after the 2017 Tubbs fire. And here you see these trees still have needles. Um, yes, some of them, are, uh, they, they, there was a, there was a surface fire, so you see the damage there, and those trees are hurting. But you look up at the ridge line, looking up to the northeast, and here you see where it came across. It came across grass and chaparral. Our main point has been in the capital, uh, cutting trees is not going to protect the houses and lives that we want to have done. That's not to say there aren't reasons for us to be doing work in the forest but it cannot be seen as a way to protect the houses and communities. You have to do the work of actually protecting those houses, and we just went through what, what all of that means. All right, here is a quick example of, uh, this is this again, same picture as you saw before from the campfire up at Paradise. And um, a couple things I wanna point out here. Um, one is, this is, here's, Here's paradise all through down in here. There's a network of f fuel breaks that have put in, been put in. Not only that, here's, a 2000, here's the remnants of a 2008 fire after which they did a bunch of salvage logging, including clear cutting. 
for hundreds of acres all through here. So you could not in some ways ask for more of a fuel break. There's tons of fuel break all here in this area where they'd pulled out all of these trees, the dead trees, after the, that fire. Here was the ignition, and then as we saw how quickly the progression came. Well, that, because, that was because it was not going tree to tree. These were being dri wind-driven embers that were um, wind, wind-driven fire where the embers were being blown, and sometimes half a mile, a mile ahead of, ahead of the fire front. The point being, there might be reasons to do the thinning. You might have ecological purposes for doing the thinning, but we cannot rely on that to protect our houses and communities from fire. We have to actually do the work of protecting the houses and communities. Um, one other example, perfect. Um, we've already hit roads quite a bit. And, um, and here we are with um, Woolsey Fire. This is an eight-lane highway, which gives you about 110-plus feet of asphalt. That is obviously a lot of fuel break there. And what we saw time and again, both in that fire and most of the other fires I mentioned today, is that it crosses straight over those roadways. And that's because we're talking about embers, not about crown fire. Here's one project right here um, at El Granada Quarry park fuel break. It's one of, the ca one of CAL FIRE's 35 projects that Governor Newsom exempted from CEQA and Environmental Review in order to expedite it this year. I don't have any problem with this particular project. It's, it's a series of fuel breaks and understory thinning, I think, and uh, shaded fuel break all, all through this area. And you see this is a patch of green right next to this development. And given the wind direction, could be a huge source of embers during a, during a wind-driven event. But our point that we've been making is let us not forget that all of that is not protecting the community from all of the area around it. That's where the trees are, yes. But let me take you back really quick to the Santa Rosa picture. And it was here, up there, all through the grassland and chaparral, which is where the fire actually came through, where the ignitions, one after another, leapfrogged up and into Santa Rosa bef before or without any of that crown fire occurring. All right, so what do we want? This is my last slide. What do we want? Here's San Mateo. For, those, for, the, for the money, effort, focus, and resources that we, want to, that we, the state, and people of the state want to put towards protecting houses and communities, lives and property from fire, that money, those resources, need to be focused on the houses and communities themselves, the areas directly around them. If you're going to be doing forest thinning, vegetation removal, getting into habitat, that has to be directly tied to a project where you are protecting those houses and communities. I don't want to see projects where we're going in and cutting into the forest and not having done the work adjacent so that those houses remain in exactly the same level of risk as before, and all we've done is beat up the habitat. And lastly, in those areas that are away from houses and communities, I want that, we want that management driven by ecological concerns. We want that management there to be driven by habitat needs, by wildlife concerns, and by what our long-term goals are for that, not as a place where we're going to be doing, um, doing fuel breaks that are intended or purported to be helping us with our, with our fire risk reduction. That's it. Thank you very much. So before we go to our next speaker, I want to remind people to be sending your questions down because after our last speaker, we're going to have, um, we, you don't have the cards, okay? We'll, we'll get the cards to you. Um, may raise your hand if you want a card. Paul will give you one and um, send them down. So after the last speaker, we'll have a Q&A for everyone. So um, our next speaker is, uh, is uh, April Summer, and she's the executive and legal director of Wild Tree Foundation. 
She brings expertise in energy regulation, environmental law, and experience in nonprofit governance and in environmental advocacy. Previously, she was executive director and lead counsel of the P P Protect Our Communities Foundation and staff attorney with the Center for Biological Diversity. A as uh, a POC lead counsel, April successfully advocated before the Cup California Public Utilities Commission and California courts for denial of approval for a new natural gas pipeline and denial of a 379 million rate increase for San Diego Gas and Electric for the cost of a series of fires the utility caused in 2007. At CBD, she challenged the development of dirty utility infrastructure, advocated for sustainable energy and protection of wildlife in practice before the CPUC, CEC, and air districts. Uh, she has a Bachelor's of Science in Natural Resources from Cornell University and a, a law degree from Emory University. Please welcome April um, Summer. So um, this is the only um, picture you're going to have. Unfortunately, Brian had beautiful photographs. I have um, some um, boring charts and lots of words, but hopefully some interesting information. So I'm going to talk about utility caused fires um, and uh, tree trimming. So I hope folks can see this. And I think this kind of pulls together um, already a lot of the information that we've heard this morning. Um, these are, this is a list of the most destructive fires um, since uh, 1932 when the records were kept um, in California. Um, most destructive uh, structures burned and deaths. And um, it, the, the interesting thing, the first six, um, just kind of pulling from some of the previous presentations, you can see these are all fires that um, occurred in the fall. And those were all fires that were associated with um, these uh, Santa Ana or Diablo wind events. But what I'm going to talk about is utility caused fire. So what we see here, um, and particularly um, the in the last few years, is about half of these most destructive fires are caused by power lines. Um, and I think earlier we heard that it, about 9% of all uh, fires are utility caused. So um, it's pretty dramatic um, when you can see that um, uh, the effect that it's having on the intensity um, and destructiveness of, um, of fires. So um, there's a lot of talk about vegetation management. And vegetation is the main cause of utility um, caused fires. But that um, is, is not the whole picture. One must consider how the vegetation came into contact with the equipment and how that actually led to a fire being ignited. So very, very briefly, um, there's kind of two main ways that the um, electric utilities are going to cause a fire. Um, the first would be from transmission lines. These are the high voltage lines that um, carry power from the, the power plants um, into communities. And these lines, um, what you're most likely going to get a fire caused is um, a, a high heat event. So you'll have sagging of the lines, which are also called conductors. Um, and those lines actually, um, if not built and maintained correctly, can slap together and you get a spark and that falls into to vegetation and starts a fire. Um, the other way that that fires routinely um, and, and most commonly actually start from utilities is on the distribution lines. These are um, usually around 12 kilovolt um, lines that are in your communities. And um, if they are not insulated, contact with vegetation um, on the lines can cause sparking, um, creating fires. Um, and contact with vegetation, a tree can also break the, the conductors um, falling to the ground, causing sparks that cause fires. So um, this is from PG&E. Um, they attribute 49% of fires, this is 2015 to 2017, um, to vegetation. And if we look, and I'm going to flip through these very quickly, but if we look at um, the main fires, the destructive fires PG&E caused in, cause in 2017 to 18, you will see over and over again 
um, a tree falling on distribution line um, and and causing sparks that ignited a fire is is um, what the majority of these fires uh, the cause. So you can see tree, tree, tree. Um, the the campfire. Um, this was a combination. Um, you had a transmission line that actually uh, the tower failed and the conductor fell to the ground. Um, this was two simultaneous ignition points. And then again, vegetation making contact with distribution uh, conductors. So um, the California Public Utilities Commission, um, the regulate the investor owned utilities, um, which in this state are SCE, SDG&E, and PG&E. These are the privately owned utilities. Um, they have found they are undergoing an investigation looking to assess fines and penalties against PG&E. Um, and most of the allegations of violations have to do with um, vegetation management. Um, that they, they um, of course, there's also record keep keeping, disposing of evidence, the usual stuff that we have come to know and love so well from PG&E. So how um, can fire risk, utility cause fire risk be decreased? So looking back in time, uh, in 2007, SDG&E SDG &E caused um, a, a major firestorm, again, during an October Santa Ana wind event. Um, and we have some of the, the, the same causes that we've seen. We have a tree falling on a conductor and conductor slapping together. Um, but SDG&E got, they got pretty scared by this. And they actually took some, some corrective action. Um, some of the things that you can see that they did was actually improving um, conductors, weather stations and cameras, um, ins increased inspections and maintenance. And SDG&E has not caused a major catastrophic fire since 2007. Um, the other utilities did not learn from the lessons of SDG&E &E and did not implement many of the, the methods that they, um, they undertook. So this is a slide from SCE. Um, and the point here is, and, and we'll get into some of the, the different risk reduction methods, but this here is talking about undergrounding and um, a covered conductor. A covered conductor is basically an insulated wire, so there's actually some material on the outside of, of the wire. It's not just bare wire. And as you can see, undergrounding um, basically completely removes all fire risk. Undergrounding is very expensive, um, but it is, it's the, the only way you are, you're, you're going to eliminate all possibility. Um, covered conductors is um, much less expensive, um, and, and there's a, a, lot, a, a high chance that you can really redu reduce the risk. Um, this is again from SCE. This is interesting. Some tests they had done. These are cover conductors. It's basically plastic on top of the wires. And they've simulated um, a tree falling onto the wires and the wires slapping together. And with the cover conductors, you get, you get no arcing, you get no sparks, you get no fire. So this is the list of the you know, kind of main techniques that are available for reducing utility cost fires. Um, I would kind of generally, this is kind of um, my personal belief of this is a, a rank order of what's really going to be most effective. Um, down at the bottom, we've got vegetation management and de-energization. And um, unfortunately, those are the methods that PG&E is, is focusing on. They are doing some of these other things, um, you know, cameras and weather stations. They're putting them in now, um, as we talked about SDG and &E, you know, that's something that they have had in place for many, many years. Um, uh, so let's talk a little about what they're actually doing. So um, the investor-owned utilities were required to submit wildfire mitigation plans, something they've done in the past, but of course there's been more focus on this um, recently. And their, you know, as I, as I discussed, their main approach is vegetation management and these de-energizations. And they have a, they call this the enhanced vegetation management measures um, in high fire threat districts. Um, that's a, a large, you see they've got 25, over 25,000 miles 
of um, lines that are in those high fire districts. So it's, it's a, a large part of the northern part of the state. Um, so in, re in regards to actually taking measures to um, improve the safety of the lines, they, as you can see there on the bottom, they are planning to only reconductor, um, and that does not even necessarily mean that they're going to be um, covering conductors, but it, at least having um, conductors that are perhaps um, stronger, 150 miles of their system. So it's pretty, okay. Um, so, okay, very briefly, um, what they're looking to do and what they have been doing is the four-foot radius um, for tree trimming is the required standard. They have expanded that to 12-foot, also looking to do some um, cutting up, you can see that kind of orange, and 15 feet on either side, as well as um, attacking what they call the top 10 trees, which are basically half of the trees in, in this part of the state, um, and they W maybe be looking to do tree trimming um, that may be up to, could be as far as 60 feet, very, very far from the lines, 200 feet perhaps. Um, they are looking to uh, remove significantly more trees than they have in the past. Um, and they are doing it on uh, public and private lands. So uh, one of the things that Karen asked me to talk about is um, you know, tree trimming, what can communities do about it, um, what can individuals do. So PG&E does technically, they have an approved wildfire mitigation plan that they can trim within this, this 12 feet, um, even though it is exceeds, exceeds what's required. Um, they do have the authority to come and do marking. This is a tree with the X that is marked for removal. Um, Local governments do have um, a number of tools to be able to address mass tree trimming in their communities. Um, the PG&E cannot just come in, they need to work with municipalities and they need to, um, you know, they need to comply with local ordinances such as heritage tree ordinances. In some um, instances there's going to be CEQA requirements. Um, CAL FIRE has rules regarding the removal and there may be other state and federal laws um, that apply um, that communities can use to not allow PG to come and do whole haul, whole, 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 uh, huge tree removal that may not actually be increasing um, public safety. On private property, um, despite uh, PG&E's efforts to otherwise, they are required to have an arborist opinion. So if um, PG&E is on your property, you can um, demand that you, you know, basically things be, be kicked up from the tree trimming uh, crew that's there and um, have an arborist opinion. Um, this bushes, this has to do with removal um, beneath um, the, the low um, stuff. This is something they've been doing, but in the future, um, According to the CPC, they need to work with homeowners. Um, okay, um, guess last two slides. Um, disputes, uh, you can dispute PG&E. Um, despite what PG&E will tell you otherwise, they do have a responsibility to um, remove debris. Um, and there are, you can work with PG&E um, for other options than full tree removal, um, trimming, topping, um, and potentially um, no removal at all. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, April. So uh, just a reminder, uh, if any of you have questions, uh, raise your hands because we have people here that can pass out uh, cards to you. So um, feel free to uh, ask a question. Um, and this will be at the end of the event. We, we're going to make a little transition here. But uh, while we're doing that, uh, let me introduce the next speaker. I'm really delighted to have uh, Dr. Graham Kent from University of Nevada in Reno. I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Kent uh, during um, a major two-day conference in Sacramento back in March. It was called the uh, Wildfire Technology Innovation Summit. Uh, it was a pretty amazing event with a lot of technology companies from Silicon Valley and elsewhere, really uh, globally, uh, discussing various types of 
uh, things that could be applied to detecting um, a fire and dealing with it. Uh, we've talked about the, the climate issues. We've talked about tree issues, um, utility issues. Now we're going to talk about earlier detection because a lot of these communities uh, have found that um, they wish they had gotten earlier alerts. Uh, a lot of times the fires are in the middle of the night. Everybody's asleep. So what is it uh, other than people seeing a fire and reporting it that could be put in place to deal with this? So uh, to give a little background, Dr. Kent, he's the director of the Nevada Seismological Laboratory, professor in the Department of Geological Sciences and Engineering at UNR. Um, and he's had uh, a considerable background uh, had worked with the Scripps Institution of Oceanography for many years, uh, but the thing that, that he's involved with here that we're talking about is a collaborative uh, wildfire camera network alert system called Alert Wild Wildfire that is done as part of a consortium of three universities. It's UNR, UC San Diego, Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and University of Oregon. And so uh, the counties throughout uh, California and throughout the West have been installing some of these camera systems that were developed um, with, with unique software. And he's going to talk a little bit about that and how uh, we in San Mateo County uh, have an opportunity to uh, create a, a system like this. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Kent. Thanks, Ken. Uh, after the ducks drummed the wolf pack last week by about 70 points, we're kind of wondering whether we should drop Oregon from our uh, relationship. <laughs> they they kind of ran it up. Hey, so I'm up here. Um, uh, my wife Stephanie Kent's also here. And there's a huge team, again, at three universities. And I honestly would say if you look at uh, our efforts over the last six years, but especially escalating the last uh, 12 months, we have literally thousands of people helping helping us. Uh, the chief here, Cox, as you all know from earlier, and I guess in a little bit, he's been very helpful in helping us kind of bust into this county as well as Ken and others. So uh, there's a lot of people behind us with the Alert Wildfire team. So I want to talk a little bit about, it was touched briefly um, in the last talk uh, about what we, at least I call, maybe no one else calls it, but it's a San Diego County model. What can we learn from it? So San Diego County, as we know, or not. Come on. There you go. Um, San Diego County model. So as many of you know or just heard of maybe that they had a uh, utility cause fire, the witch fire in 2007. For better or for worse, in 2003, my wife and I were awoke, we woke up uh, in the community of Tierra Santa um, in San Diego. Uh, we knew something was up, went to KUSI. They told us that, oh my God, the fire just jumped 67. And they were right about three or four hours ago. So uh, it had already jumped eight, uh, essentially 15 on its way to 805. That's like 15 miles. So the fire front that was being advertised on KUSI as being real time was 15 miles off. We ultimately didn't lose our house, although other people did on our block. We're probably here today because of that experience. We, that can't happen, and yet it keeps happening again and again. So in the end of the day, <laughs> we're going to try to make sure that that doesn't happen, and all the first responders and firefighters are going into situations that are, in, in a sense, much safer than they have been in the past. And again, there's no silver bullet here. Again, we started in 2013 in earnest. Uh, we kind of puttered around for three or four years. Uh, a lot of our money first came from an, uh, an NGO up in Tahoe because folks were like, couldn't believe that this could work. So what the heck? Um, by the end of 2018, we had about 85 cameras. We now are punched above 300 and some now. So we're hoping to have about 400 in by the end of the year. Um, Again, we have a lot of the IOUs now funding us uh, from SDG&E, Edison, PG&E, Nevada Energy. Uh, we also work with the feds, with the BLM, Forest Service, NGOs, everybody who wants to get involved to build this network out. And again, these dots over here are showing you where we have cameras as of last night. 
So what do we try to do with the alert wildfire is we try to give the firefighters and first responders primarily the ability to pan tilt zoom cameras that have near infrared capabilities. And that's kind of cool. But think about it, it's even better than that. We have a flaky connection somewhere. So we want we want to give folks over in Felton or in Camino or in St. Helena the ability to basically take mostly your information as you call up on your cell phone, oh my God, I see a fire on Pine Mountain. Of course, it's not on Pine Mountain. It's over by Geyser Peak. You failed geography. You all know this. Now, as it happened last year in October, they basically corrected and mitigated that situation in about a minute. After they didn't see anything on the Pine Mountain camera, they saw it on the Geyser Peak, and away they were actually going to the right direction. We also provide on-demand time lapse, not only to firefighters, first responders, but to you, so you can see what's going on, because that's a very uh, good way of monitoring fire behavior. Some areas we do have lightning fires. We have an integrated fire map. Uh, because we want the public to be engaged, it has to be up on essentially Amazon Web Services S3 bucket. So that's a front end of Netflix, so it's built to take wild swings. So if we have a Bel Air fire and a million people jump on our system, it can, t it can take it. I got to pay a big bill after that, but it, we can deal with it. Here's a tricky part. For our solar installations, we have to, um, see I touch the screen and it goes down. HDMI version of this? Yeah. Okay. We have to keep our solar systems going up until w the time when there's no sun, which is around December 21st. Think of the Thomas fire. So, again, we have to figure out how to be smarter with our smarter power systems. Again, we want this thing to work on your cell phones, on your iPads, on your laptops, because we're not exactly sure what you're going to be looking at these fires with. And, um, yeah, I think it's, it's a bad cable. Yeah. Yeah. I know. How about this? Is there an HDMI cord? I don't know if there's. Yeah, there is. In HDMI, we trust. Oh, okay. We have an experiment going on here. Um, but just to give you a sense between 2016, 2018, we were involved with over 600 fires. That's a big number. We're well over 1,000. We don't even count them anymore. I can't keep track of it. It's just too much. All right, so what does this do? Why has this been successful? Why the folks that have used this now swear by it? The first thing is it's going to reduce response time to wildfires because you're going to know. There's a lot of guesswork that goes into response in large part because sometimes the intel that's there isn't good or it's conflicting. And we don't want to send planes or trucks going full speed to the wrong place or to just drift smoke because you're not all trained to know the difference between a fire start and drift smoke. We see this happen all the time, less so where we have the cameras. Number two is definitely the key point. It allows dispatch to do an escalation or de-escalation to save money and, uh, and make it safer for everyone because you don't want to have a lot of people going when you don't need to. It allows that escalation to happen immediately, as we'll see in a minute. If it gets away from us, you can everybody, including the public, can follow the fire behavior in real time. 
one of these other things is, unfortunately, if the fire really gets away from us, you'll see in our system the traffic just go through the roof because now everybody's going, hey, wait a minute. There's smoke in the area. There's a fire. I'm not exactly sure. You get on alert wildfire, you can actually kind of figure it out pretty easily what's going on. You know where your cameras in your area are, and they can be used to also uh, better coordinate evacuation. And this is the tunnel fire here. Um, in the end of the day, these cameras park on top of fires that have been knocked down. And as we know from the tunnel fire, it came back up and reignited. One of the things uh, that's cool about using near infrared is nighttime becomes an easier environment to uh, catch ignition, track wildfires. This is a um, down power line, a Liberty power line. It's definitely way more than 12 feet away from the actual power line. You can see about this big, and it snaps 20 feet up. Not, we grew up in Tahoe, that's a rare event. But it's a big old tree, and it just obviously went down and hit the power line and, uh, and off the racing. So we're, we're going to see the first near-infrared flash on the, uh, on the clouds here, right there. This is 19 miles away. We're about uh, we're about uh, 10 minutes right now into the event. So 10 minutes into the event, it already looks like a Roman candle. You're going to see that. You're going to see it probably about two or three minutes after the event. So my guess is given the wind speed here, uh, you would think that the clouds would have already been in that area. We'd be de-energized already, given the forecast. That wasn't the case here. They had escalated, uh, Cal Fire and Forest Service had escalated uh, firefighters into this region because the forecast said rain at midnight, they all sent them home. Rain happened about 3.34. We don't know what the outcome would have been, but again, as we see from the San Diego County model, better weather modeling, better understanding, you'll kind of know when that rain front's likely to hit you. One of the things, obviously, for both you and, and folks at dispatch is you look at kind of old-fashioned way of crossing two towers, usually with binoculars or cameras, and clicking this point here, and you get to locate where the fire is pretty quickly. So there's that location service to allow us to know exactly where it's going. So how does this, how does this work? Again, San Diego County Lilac Fire. Up about somewhere between about seven and 10 days into this, or before this event, we started work, because uh, we're working with sdg &E, we started getting from their head meteorologist like, oh, this isn't good. Everything's gonna line up for a big mountain wave, big Santa Ana. Everybody, let's start paying attention. As we got closer and closer to the event, it was like, our hair's on fire. Like, this is going to be the worst fire conditions in San Diego history. And you knew what we know from being burned over on <laughs> those bad days. The Thomas Fire, Skirball Fire, other fires up north. If you know anything about how Santa is set up, sometimes they slide from the north all the way down to the south. So everybody was poised to go. And you hope this doesn't happen, but it happens. This is a little bit into the fire. Uh, this is what our interface looked like at the time, just so you know. Here are all the cameras you get to pick. I pick, let's see, if I pick this one here at Red Mountain, click it, I get this. If I right click it, I get time lapse. Here's the map, so on and so forth. So you and the public can, can watch it. Unfortunately, uh, some type of RV caught fire on old Highway 395 next to I-15 north of Escondido. And um, so we know right now that Cal Fire, Monta Vista unit, Corey Costa, six seconds to this point of the camera here. I said, Corey, how'd you do that so quickly? My mom lived over here. <laughs> I said, okay, I understand. <laughs> but he'd only used the system for about two months and he was already on it. <laughs> 11.15 in the morning. This is literally uh, uh, about 40 seconds after the 911 call. They're already looking at this. So the chief there, Chief Beecham Cal Fire, immediately said, I'm going to look at all the other cameras. Does anybody see anything from throughout the county? Okay, they all agreed. Now we're sending every resource out the door onto this fire. 
And he testified to the Board of Supervisors in San Diego. He wouldn't have done that without that knowledge of, A, this was a bad situation, and B, the rest of the county with essentially not having some type of event spin up. Because again, it's a very bad day. In fact, the worst day. All right, so let's go off to the races. This is super duper time lapse. <laughs> This is one of four cameras that were on this incident until it was out. So I'm not showing you all of them, but it was more or less surrounded by the cameras. Everybody kind of knew what was going on. It ultimately burned 4,050 acres. Most everybody thought that this had the potential of going all the way to I-5, multi-billion dollar event. The fact they did an informed gamble and sent everybody partway through the day a fire broke out on the border, which they were able to triangulate immediately to say that it was in Mexico. Sorry, folks, but we're not going to peel any resources. Before these cameras, they would have had to peel resources away because they weren't sure it was a bit of a tweener earthquake, again, right on the border. So a year later, a couple days after Woolsey fire, the area is already de-energized and stuff happens, right? So this is one of my favorite ones. Watch quickly, though. This is out by Ramona. Uh, there's a house fire that's going to town and is ready to jump into the woo. And it gets called in, quickly confirmed on the camera system. stg &E already has a dedicated sky crane helicopter. And away we go. Pop, 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 pop. The fire trucks show up. So again, another example of a high wind event. But it's not just San Diego County. Here's our friendly arsonist that people didn't know about up in South Lake Tahoe, lit over two dozen fires. And when that, that tree, falling tree caused fire, the Emerald Fire, well, he was smart to a degree and then stupid in other ways. He decides to light a fire down here and use this as the decoy to get this to go into a neighborhood. What he messed up is he let it right on the camera view and everybody saw it. And they knocked it down. Another high wind event. How about more locally? So this was the Deer Fire and the Bonnie Dune Tower. And I should thank, it's hard to get into areas sometimes with towers and we can get to it in the questions and the answer session, but Mike Lyon from Wireless, uh, um, uh, Ridge Wireless, uh, he's an internet provider, a list. He's on his own accord, has gone out and more or less, you have cameras in this region because of him. I don't know if he's here today, otherwise. Go use his service if you need internet. <laughs> and then Matthew Kaufman also allows to get on his tower. And this is what it looks like in your neighborhood. And you can start to see the attacks coming in. So if you're in Felton or if you're in Sacramento or if you're just board and you want to see what's happening because you live in Boulder Creek and are getting a little worried. This is a bird here. Um, <laughs> they always look for attention. <laughs> but you can make a lot of good decisions doing a lot of stuff in real time. So here's an example. Um, this year, even though it hasn't been a big fire year, um, Cal Fire escalated dramatically just upon seeing this video of the mountain fire. Uh, and they wouldn't have not been able to do it had they not had this uh, camera. And then we actually had five more cameras in there. So I'm going through it quickly. Here's the point. This is a community here. It takes a village. It takes a lot of people here working to get these things in. We worked with dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of people just to get Alert North Bay in, right? And we're working with all these wireless internet service providers to build out throughout the West. And we need your help because we don't have enough cameras in this area. And so, again, if you have some property you think we might be able to get a camera with a good view, let us know. Uh, we're working right now putting two cameras on this campus, one over in La Cunada College, one up on the uh, college, the one with the view, it's Skyline. Uh, we're working with Santa Clara. Unfortunately, if you, who lives in San Mateo County? Okay, your emergency communications is it's, it's voice band analog T1. Like, 
that's unconscionable. Uh, so we can't use it, but like, really? Like, how does that even happen? Uh, this is what one of our systems looks like uh, in a burnover area from North Bay. And since uh, we're already talking about fire world, here's one from uh, the wall fire. So thank you, Linda. I appreciate that. Thank you, Dr. Kent. So um, th this is uh, an opportunity to all communities public agencies such as water districts, utilities, et cetera, to get on board on creating these networks that have been expanding throughout the West. And San Mateo County is starting to go in that direction, but obviously we have more work to do. So to conclude this event, we're going to have uh, three speakers that are from uh, San Mateo County uh, that can talk about the, the things that the county is doing uh, to prepare for wildfires, to deal with emergencies, and our first speaker uh, is uh, Dan Belleville. He's the director of the County Public Safety Communications, which he's been at for three years. Uh, also, he's been a big help in uh, working with us to uh, schedule this event here at the college and the county in general, but his department in particular have been uh, enormous assistance to put this event, help to put this event together. Um, as the 911 communications uh, and, uh, by the way, former fire chief of uh, cities of San Mateo and Foster City. Uh, he is heading up uh, it, the development of a new 911 center, which is uh, nearing the end of its construction over in Redwood City. And it will have a lot of functionality uh, to deal with emergencies, and he'll go into that. Um, it has its own reserve power, so if we have a power outage, uh, it can still function. So it's pretty exciting facility that we have this uh, coming into the county. And so to, to lead off a discussion on responses uh, that the county is putting together, introduce uh, Dan Belleville. Thank you, Ken. A, a quick shout out to Ken for, uh, boy, staying with it and trying to get the word out and incorporate you folks, the citizens of the county, uh, to help out because my, my early years in the fire service, it seemed like it was only the fire service, and it takes all of us now, as has been discussed earlier the day in the day. So, Ken, thank you for all your efforts and the team that you brought. Appreciate it. Uh, my name is Dan Belleville, and uh, I'm currently in charge of the communication system. And um, a quick summary of our facility and, and the technologies that it's bringing and how they might incorporate uh, into the first response and the first responders, I think it will be very helpful for you today. Um, we have 75 people. We've grown substantially in recent years. Uh, we have uh, four different shifts of folks. And probably the most important piece here is not only am I the director of public safety com communications, but I report directly to the county manager with my fire service background, we're collaborating up to and including the cameras, one of which will be installed in this very building that Dr. Graham just talked about a few moments ago. So I work with Denise and Chief Cox and the citizens groups and sort of everything fire. So the county's trying to make a significant effort in some of the things that we're doing because it takes a multifaceted approach uh, to this whole wildland fire issue. We have multi-discipline -dis dispatch. We dispatch for law, fire, and EMS. And then miscellaneous services would be things like uh, animal services, uh, security along Caltrans, SWAT teams, uh, law mutual aid, law uh, fire mutual aid, uh, just a host of dozens of different uh, organizations and folks that we work with to provide 24-7 communications. This is just a few pictures of some of the people you know, that we work with. This here is the uh, YouTube incident up in uh, San Bruno a couple of months ago, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, today's discussion is to talk uh, over our new building and the, the rock. It's often referred to as a rock as the regional operations center where it's sort of the brain trust of where all the emergency resources are going to get dispatched from. Our new computer-aided dispatch. Uh, we're also revamping our entire G GIS uh, system and our positioning. And we'll talk about the new technologies and some of the readiness that uh, we have for the county. 
We've been attempting to get into a new building for about 30 years. We're currently in the basement of uh, 400 County Center where you often visit for jury duty and, and clap loudly when you get out of jury duty because we hear you right next door. Uh, but anyway, just a couple of quick shots here. We've been under construction for about uh, two years now. It was a very interesting construction project. They poured about two feet of concrete. It's a new method, and once the concrete was poured, they then drilled through and put 90-foot piers in um, to basically pin it to the ground. So it's a pretty sturdy building. Some more photos here over the last 12 months or so. Uh, metal framing about nine months ago. And these are more of the finished products on the exterior of the building, and this is what it looks like today. We're going to go live in about a month. Uh, our projected go live date for dispatch is 1022. So we'll be getting out of the basement for about 50 years and into this brand new facility so that we can dispatch emergency first responders. Uh, it's built to withstand. So if, how many folks have heard of essential services construction? This is a building code standard that was established. I think it was in 1986. And the purpose of it is to strengthen buildings that are essential to government and certain functions so that they continue functioning uh, after an emergency, whether there's a flood or a wind event or a fire or an earthquake in this case. And uh, we're above the essential services, so it's intended to last for you know 50 to 75 years uh, under significant uh, circumstances. As I mentioned, we put 200 piers in. Um, there's about two, 220, I think, that are about 90 feet deep that pin it into the ground. We have not one, but two 1.25 megawatt diesel generators. They're massive. They're probably 15 feet high and maybe 30 feet long and 20 feet wide. And uh, they have the capacity to power the entire building nonstop. They sit on fuel cells for seven days, and we have not only one, but two of them for redundancy. We also have two 10,000-gallon tanks of water that is cycled through the building so it doesn't become stale water. So essentially what it allows us to do is to run the emergency operations center for about 7 to 14 days uninterrupted without even having to um, shut anything down or refuel. So it's, it's pretty impressive in terms of what it will do under significant circumstances. We have several large video walls. Uh, our video wall on the dispatch center on the second floor is about the size of this whole wall here, probably 300 square feet of video. And what it will do is we can extract the pieces of information visually that will be helpful to us in the event of emergency, like the cameras that Dr. Graham just talked about, the maps, um, where fire might be traveling, all the different technologies that are coming in and can be streamed on, on a video wall about the size of this back wall here. This is not us today. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what that thing is. Uh, there's these things that uh, don't exist any longer. The point is, is technology is changing very, very, very rapidly. And it's hard to keep up with it, and especially in the world of 911 dispatch. Um, we've ramped up very dramatically in terms of what's coming in and what is required over the next couple of years, and we're trying to keep pace with that. Kind of an interesting, interesting stat. I just found this the other day. This is from April of 81, for those that can't see it. But this is the extraction of what came out of this document that I found. In 81, we had 4,200 law incidents, almost 1,000 miscellaneous incidents, dog catcher, things like that, and then a uh, little over 2,000 EMS incidents for uh, 7,300 in one entire year. And it represented a 5 to 10 percent annual increase, this letter, over the previous four years. We had a staff of 14 people. The funny thing is today, it's a little busier. This was last year's stats. We're um, probably over a half a million calls received now because we're going up about 3 to 4% a year. Of those calls, we dispatch or CAD incidents about 400,000. So what is that delta of 100,000? Well, if someone rolls over a vehicle in El Camino Real, we might get 20 calls. With the uh, San Bruno incident at YouTube, I think we received 400 calls in 20 minutes when she went in to fire that weapon. So that's what that delta is. So we're about a half a million calls coming in, and we dispatch about 400,000 of them, which, which should be our 19 stats eventually. 90% of all calls are received within 10 seconds. So all those calls that come up, we have a, a performance where we have to pick those up in 10 seconds. So you can imagine if we had a wildland event, 
how many thousands of calls would be coming in. Now that's where our numbers probably would drop because we can't keep up, but we'll upstaff accordingly. One of the technologies I'm looking at right now is to have remote call takers. So in the event of a major event like an earthquake or a fire, we could have people at home literally staff up by having a go pack flip open their computers and help manage that volume of incoming calls. So there's the, the technology that I'm talking about. 60% uh, of our calls are on the law side are processed in a minute and a half. Does anybody have an idea why it takes a little longer? Well, it's because law is a little different. Someone's suspicious near a window. There's a funny car down the street that's been parked for a couple of hours. So the dispatchers have to discern and, and sort of glean what they can before a law enforcement officer gets dispatched to that incident. Fire and EMS are much more straightforward. The incident is happening right now, so we get resources moving within 60 seconds. Um, we are an accredited center. The, as you can see here, there's very few in the world. Um, in, the in the U.S. alone, there's only 129 centers. 15 of them are in uh, northern, or excuse me, 15 in California. 11 of them are northern California. So we think we're pretty advanced in dispatching our resources. That what it's basically what we do is a dispatcher gives uh, instructions to the caller so that they can get immediate, immediate help to whatever that victim is receiving while fire and EMS units are responding. The technology, this is really kind of the brunt of the presentation, is our new CAD, our computer-aided dispatch, is one of six different worldwide CAD systems that were evaluated. We purchased a company out of Canada called Versaterm. And uh, it has a, a, some a significant improvements over what we have today. We'll have automatic, automatic vehicle locators, which will be on each apparatus, which then tie into the CAD, and it'll give you the global position of where those units are so the, pr the fastest unit will respond without having to do that guesswork like we do today. So in the second bullet there, the, the closest units will be um, responding to those calls quicker. We also have spent about $2 million on our GIS mapping. So the 911 standards are much higher than most GIS mapping standards. And, th and that data is being delivered as we speak right now. And then uh, we're going to use the, for the folks that are IT, virtualization technology is built into that. Um, the MDTs, uh, a fire unit, a police unit, an ambulance, will now have significant mapping and data available right in the terminal of their vehicle, which is superior to what we see today. In terms of the radio systems, FIRE has been able to speak uh, interoperably for many, many years, probably 40 years in this county. So if we dispatch uh, FIRE resources down to San Diego, they can easily pick up on the radio frequencies, like Chiefs Cox folks will be a CAL FIRE incident anywhere in the state, and FIRE units from this county can plug in. Law has been a little bit behind in that, but when our building goes live, we will be able to have interoperability with law enforcement, with um, SFO, the county and city of San Francisco, Santa Clara, Alameda, and we'll have, we'll have switches where about 20 backup radios can be quickly switched if we lose all data. You know, telephone transmission lines, they will now be operable, interoperable for the first time in, uh, in, in this county in, in many, many years. Other technologies are the video technology, and again, why we have a large video screen is we're going to get a fiber optic cable that's actually being piped in right now, and it ties into Smart Corridor. Smart Corridor, if you don't know about it, uh, essentially will help redirect traffic in the event that there's a major blockage. For example, a, a, uh, an oil tanker tips over on 101 and the traffic shuts down, Smart Corridor will pick up the cameras the signaling devices and have a coordinated event to move traffic around wherever that blockage is. We'll say on Ralston Avenue uh, on at 101. And so now we have the ability to pipe that in, that information, and project it on our video so we can direct resources how to get around that incident or what it might look like. Or if there's a fire, it gives us access to the cameras, it gives us access to other counties, and it's all fiber optic, so basically it's a giant pipeline, lots of data, and very, very fast. Uh, so we'll have a traffic feed. It, it, the, the fiber optics is high performing. Uh, we're linked to other counties, and um, it'll be extremely beneficial to have our eyes uh, and ears tuned to those areas. And then as Dr. Kent mentioned, the fire monitoring, we're going to put uh, cameras in all three of the colleges, and we're hoping to have an entire network here in the next couple of months. 
And uh, that'll be very helpful, not only for verifying the fire, but putting the right resources on the fire uh, once we respond. Other technologies are CAD to CAD. We can talk to other counties. Next Gen 911, we're in the middle of that right now. That's a modernization and a hardening of the fire technology, uh, the first response technology statewide, nationwide. And um, we have signaling devices that are interoperable with phones that will identify approaching code three vehicles so citizens will be alerted on their phones that a unit is responding. The, 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 the list is endless in terms of the technology. The key is to try to keep up with it, and uh, we think we are doing an adequate job at this point. So we're, we're ready for the future, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Dan. So uh, also uh, calling back up to the podium, uh, Chief Cox, who is going to talk about an interesting program that's been under development. Um, we've, we've heard about the problems. The, uh, we're looking at detection methods, uh, looking at climate. Uh, measurements uh, and predictions, uh, but uh, one of the key things is, so if we have this event, if we had, for example, an Oakland Hills type of fire, how would we deal with this? How would evacuations go forward? I can say that a number of other counties in the Bay Area, particularly Alameda County, uh, the East Bay Area has been uh, really on top of this. They've been doing evacuation drills and they've developed some particular protocols. And so our county, uh, under uh, Chief Cox is also moving in that direction, and he's going to tell you a little bit about a new zone evacuation plan that we should see um, uh, being implemented in the next few months. So again, Chief Cox. Thank you, Ken. As they said earlier, I'm going to switch hats and take off my Cal Fire hat and now put on my San Mateo County Fire Department hat. So uh, that's the context for this. Uh, so just to give you a quick update real quick, one of the things we've learned from some of the major fires, the Tubbs fire, the uh, Paradise fire, is these fires can't be stopped. It doesn't matter how many firefighters you throw at them, we can't stop them at that, at that stage. So it really becomes an effort to get as many people to safety in the quickest amount of time as possible. And earlier on the, uh, last year, uh, uh, Dan, myself, a few others in the county were really trying to figure out what does this look like in San Mateo County? How do we get the most people out of an area when a disaster strikes? Uh, and really it came down to this, is everybody needs the same information right now, right? The community needs the information, the media needs the information, the Office of Emergency Services needs the information, fire needs the information, law enforcement needs the information. Uh, and that's really where this standardized evacuation zone system kind of grew from. Uh, the Board of Supervisors allocated $75,000 for this countywide effort, uh, and we were lucky enough to get uh, Charlie Crocker here from Zone Haven on board to actually lead this process. Uh, I'm super excited about it. It's one of its first of its kind in the state of California. Um, one of the benefits we have in this county is that we're a borderless fire system in this county, so it doesn't matter what agency the closest fire engine is to you, that is the engine that will be going to you. So this is building upon that borderless uh, kind of mentality. So uh, that, that's just the highlights of it. We're about midway through the project right now. Um, the, uh, the zones are all based on data, and when I say data, I mean topographical features, jurisdictional features, as well as most importantly, traffic features. How do you get people from a certain location out the most effective way, and how do you zone them and kind of cluster them so that you can do it uh, smartly? What this looks like uh, I is this, and th the uh, 265 zones are kind of what we're at our preliminary right now. Uh, and they're all broken up throughout the county uh, based on the cities and then based on the, the features within them. It looks like a lot, but uh, you will have a zone uh, in the community that you live. Uh, this is an example of some of the zones locally looking back towards 280. Uh, this would be Hillsboro. Uh, and you can see a lot of these things, uh, uh, these zone boundaries are based on geographical features and natural road layers. Uh, the technology behind this, what you don't see is there's modeling that actually shows how many people and how many structures are gonna leave from each location and what the most likely route of that evacuation is. The reason that is so important is because when we're at an incident location, the law enforcement partner standing next to us knows exactly where to control traffic to get the most people out in the most effective method. Uh, so that is an, an example of what this will look like when it uh, actually comes uh, uh, to full public view later this year. 
The other component to it that's really uh, interesting is we can start to look at some models of where fires are burning. Uh, so let's say, for example, we have a red flag warning uh, um, fire event, there's an offshore wind, um, and we get a fire that starts. Something that's really important for fire officials is to know if a fire starts here under these conditions, what zones do I need to start thinking about in one hour, three hours, and five hours? And if I do need to evacuate those, I can now choose them and everybody is on the same page at the same time. So Kevin Rose from the Office of Emergency Services will have these zones in the SMC alert system and as soon as fire and law agree that those are the zones to be evacuated, that information can go out at the exact same time that Dan Center with PSC 911 can see when you call 911, do I need to evacuate? They have the same information as well. So really what this is is a standardized process for all evacuation zones in the county. Uh, we are, we're pretty excited. We're the first county to do this. So uh, uh, we're, 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 we're kind of in uncharted territory where we're going, but it's probably the single biggest um, um, direct benefit to saving lives should there be a major wildland fire in this county. Uh, you should see it coming out later this year and you'll probably see it promoted much more uh, heavily with your local fire or law enforcement agencies. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Cox. Um, and then uh, rounding out uh, our uh, speakers from San Mateo County, uh, as you can see, there are a number of offices that work collaboratively. Um, so I'm, I'm pleased now to uh, introduce uh, uh, Kevin Rose, who is the manager of the Office of Emergency Services. Uh, he joined uh, OES in uh, May of uh, 2018 and was promoted to manager in March of 2019. Um, he was, prior to that, a emergency preparedness specialist for the county EMS agency for 12 years. Uh, during his tenure there, he served as deputy medical health operational area coordinator for San Mateo County. Among the, uh, the emergencies that he was called out to uh, was the, the crash of the Asiana Air Flight at SFO, um, which I think everybody recalls. Uh, prior to that, uh, his experience with EMS, he worked as a legislative ad aide for the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors for five years and a field representative for Congresswoman Anna Eshu for two years. So um, Kevin is now overseeing uh, some of the latest issues which have to do with power shutdowns and emergency communications, and he'll talk to us a little bit about that. So I present to you Kevin Rose. Great. Thank you, Ken. I'm a little more scripted in my response, so I'll make it a fireside chat. Um, and I do want to bring you guys back up to speed because I know there's a lot of questions. And so I'll, I'll go rapidly through this first aspect of my presentation. Um, and, and thank you, Ken. Yeah, Kevin Rose, San Mateo County Office of Emergency Services, basically the operational area jurisdiction that connects all of your cities that have your own emergency managers with us which in turn with disasters for situational awareness and if there's a significant amount of resources needed for catastrophic events to the state, the state to the Fed. So this is sort of an incident command system, standardized emergency management system response in which we interact with all the cities. And then of course within the unincorporated areas, we are your municipality in some capacity. So that's, that's my office in essence of uh, my staff and what we do. The two components we we're gonna be talking about um, today are the, uh, oops, there we go, yeah. So uh, the theme itself is when wildfire safety, this is sort of the unintended consequences of trying to prevent wildfire safety with regards to PG&E and what's going on. This is the piece I'm gonna go rapidly through. The big point is go to pg&e.com and you'll see everywhere posted with regards public safety power shutoff, you'll see power outages, you'll see wildfire alerts, please sign up. And the reason being is that the California Public Utilities Commission was kind of mentioned earlier today, the three big energy companies, San Diego, General Electric, Edison, and PG&E, they've all come to agreement with regards to what's going to be this public safety power shutoff. Something's actually San Diego uh, has been doing, but more so in rural areas where if there's um, certain criteria met where they think it'll be high fire threat or high fire threat infrastructure damage or the infrastructure causing the fire, that in essence uh, they're going to they're shut off the transmission lines impacting communities. Uh, for PG&E, essentially, with this occurring, they're going to 
be notifying both the public and then also um, on the uh, more of the first responder agency governmental side as well. So the importance about signing up is that they're only going to be reaching their customers. So for those of you who live in large uh, apartment complexes or condominiums like myself, it's the homeowners association or the, uh, the landlord that is that PG&E customer. They don't have your contact information. Or especially for renters as well, it's the landlord that has the information, and they don't have necessarily your updated information. So please go there and uh, sign up accordingly. So the one thing um, that I just mentioned with regards to the agreement, so the these are the criteria for a public safety power shutoff activation. Uh, the red flag warning, low humidity levels, forecast sustained winds 25 mile per hour with gusts uh, greater than 45 miles an hour, the dry fuel load on the ground, and then PG&E will in person basically be viewing to see that final decision. They'll have what's called a Wildland Safety Operations Center that's actually located up in San Francisco, their headquarters, making these decisions. Why I'm going to rapidly go through this portion of my presentation is that they finally, with their meteorologist, did modeling, and San Mateo County isn't really necessarily even on their map. We are very fortunate with regards to right now our marine layer, so um, around sunset, around 280, 92 intersection, please go and thank the fog and the marine layer for protecting our county as much as it does. Now mind you, within 25, 30, 40, 50 years, this is gonna be a much different story, but the weather modeling pg &E is finally done with regards to this five criteria. We are not at threat. However, being the disaster preparedness, planning preparedness, mitigation response recovery individuals, strike when they are hot, this is the excellent opportunity to remind you about your own safety, about being important with regards to your own disaster preparedness with your family, yourself, and as much information as possible to be tied into. So that's the more direct route, but pg&e.com, the main website, has this information and you directly get to the, um, the links themselves um, to get to you. And, and what's going to occur is that there's going to be that public-facing aspect of information that you'll be receiving, outage maps, um, impacted areas, hopefully within 24, 48 hours notice. Government agencies, we're supposed to be um, getting a little bit of a head start basically to communicate with all of you and we'll indicate how and such. Uh, again, this we aren't any anywhere near the areas that are uh, threat or impact. North County, they have had some um, PSPS incidents, but they haven't really lasted more than 12 hours or whatnot. So we haven't, and PG&E hasn't seen that impact yet. They're still drawing up their plans, but we are working with them in concert, not only locally, but with other counties that are in our uh, disaster region. It's the coastal region, Bay Area stretching up uh, coastal communities to the Oregon border and then our California Office of Emergency Services. So state, regional, and local, we're working directly with PG&E to get as much information as possible. Now on the county side, what we're doing, and also working with cities as well, but county we're starting off just initially, is a draft plan that a lot of other counties in the region are working on as well, this de-energization plan. It's still in draft form, but basically what we're looking at is twofold. One is more so the services that we provide as the county. We are that safety net, so a lot of services um, for our individuals, healthcare, social services, food, nutrition, et cetera. Uh, we are taking a, um, a study of our infrastructure to see what kind of power outages might impact us and our services. Within a day, not so much during the work days or what have you. If it's going on more than a day or two, then yeah, what we do is what's called a continuity of operations. What are our essential services and where are we going to maybe relocate and provide those to the community? For a lot of cities, and your municipalities are looking into this, their emergency generation power is a little more uh, robust in the, in the percentage of the building that they're able to keep up operating. For us, the county, aside from the major uh, critical infrastructure of our youth services center, our jails, our hospitals, um, we mostly, our emergency generation is just powering emergency lighting in the elevators. So HVAC goes out. So if it's more than a day, uh, we're not going <laughs> to uh, have our employees suffer from this kind of uh, uh, difficulty in working in, those, um, in, in that environment. But we, again, relocate those services. So that's the plans that we're working on, also working on with your cities as well. Now the important aspect, and, and let me quickly go back, oops, to one point at the very bottom. Uh, if this is an event that impacts our services or becomes a disaster of some sorts that we need to respond to, we're activating an emergency operations center. 
and our emergency operations center, the response that we do is supporting the field in their tactical response to whatever the incident might be. So they have the information they need and the resources as well. The joint information center, and this is going to be the crux of my presentation, is the messaging, the communications that we're making uh, with all of our agencies and, uh, and also, most importantly, to you with the, with the, uh, the public. So if this were to happen and we get the one to two day notification, the county in agreement with the cities is going to send that SMC alert. How many people are signed up for SMC alert? Excellent. The rest of you with your hands out, smcalert.info. Please sign up. That will be our major communication to everyone, and then that message will be amplified by the cities and also by our county with social media um, aspect. And that, in addition to other forms of notification that a lot of resilient communities have built within their own constituencies, continues that amplification of message. If the event goes on for two, three more days or whatnot, then the cities are doing direct communications with their residents because now they're going to be not only dealing with public communications, but internal communications with their staff about what level of services they may or may not provide uh, based upon the event. So the important communication aspect, and I put this slide up to gain your empathy of the bureaucracy we work with in the essence of alert and warning communications, is this is the federal program. If this public safety power shut off becomes an emergency, becomes an actual event that we need to respond to in some kind of aspect, fire uh, will being the, the, the major one, if there is major outages that um, uh, in, impacts more so of the vulnerable communities, our healthcare system, our 911 system, this is a communication system that enhances our opportunities and abilities to communicate with the public at large. This is when disasters strike. If it's just the public safety power shut off, it's that SMC alert, it's that messaging that comes to you by text, by phone, by email, you sign up for it, you customize it, not only just if it's a major disaster, all 100,000 subscribers, which is basically one out of, eight, uh, one out of seven, one out of eight of this community, are going to be receiving that messages regardless. But for day to day, if you can sign up for um, police activities, fire activities that are going on, hazmats, road closures, uh, wildlife impact or whatnot. You can also sign up based on geography, cities, et cetera. So you customize and you control how you receive it. But in emergencies, you're getting the message. We're, we're just blasting it out to you. Now, the components we have, and I forgot to include up there reverse 911 that I'm sure a lot of you have heard about. Our SMC alert system, we have two sides of it, the, the, the subscriber side, the 100,000, and then we have what's referred to as the reverse 911 side. This is the POTS, the plain old telephone landline systems, upwards of 600,000 lines that we have similar to our dispatch center that if this event occurs, the reverse 911, that is the messaging being sent out as well. Additionally, we have the emergency alert system. This is the one that you receive on your uh, um, TV and cable, and they even have some um, components of radio aspect as well. So that is another communication method at our disposal. The wireless emergency alert system, this is one that's really more geographic based of the various cell phone towers in an area you're trying to ping. Unfortunately, it's not a phenomenal system, but it is one improving because it is dependent upon the cell phone tower and the carrier of whom uh, provides your cell phone coverage. So it's, it's hitting more than 50, two thirds, they'll say three quarters or higher, but um, they've done a couple national tests and the numbers are a little shaky, but it's another way to hit. There's no silver bullet, there's no 100% ability to communicate with one another. And then the um, NOAA weather alert. These are special NOAA radios. And our National Weather Service, we're very fortunate. We have excellent partners with the National Weather Service in helping us with these communications aspects. So a lot of government agencies, schools, um, our OES offices have this first responders. The NOAA radio is another communicator, basically to let you know of um, weather impacts that are going to be threatening or are threatening the community as well. So these are all encompassing, in essence, of every type of aspect of communication we'll be sending out your way uh, for any type of catastrophic event. And then uh, looking forward to the, uh, the, the, the Polygon system that Chief Cox, had Chief Cox had mentioned about creating those evacuation routes as well. So that is it in a nutshell. And I really want to turn it back over to all of you for the communication, all the questions that you had. But thank you so much for your time today.
Thank you, Kevin. Now, we are going to get into a, a Q&A period. We have several uh, cards here. Uh, I just want to make a couple of comments. One is that uh, this whole event is being filmed, and we have a, a wonderful uh, video cameraman back there. His name is Ken Parker. He's actually an Emmy Award winning uh, director and uh, producer, and uh, we're very grateful that he was available today to film this. It will be online uh, on a YouTube channel with links from the Sierra Club uh, chapter website uh, within the next few days. So if you have friends or colleagues or other people that you would like to expose this great presentation from all these expert speakers, you'll be able to direct them to that video. A um, couple of other comments uh, is that um, there are other events coming up, and it's, uh, it's great that some of the, the communities here are continuing to, uh, to do, be active. Hillsboro, for example, which has a very high percentage of its population living in the high hazard zone, is going to be having a wildland uh, fair safety at Town Hall. This will be September 28th uh, at Hillsboro Town Hall from 9 a.m. to 10.30. And so there's, um, I believe, some more flyers that are available if anybody would like to attend that event. And then also uh, the city of Millbrae uh, is hosting the first disaster preparedness day. That will be November 19th. Uh, from 11 to 3 p.m. at the Millbrae Civic Center Library parking lot. So uh, cities are stepping up. It's great to see that. Um, I want to just uh, make a few points here. A um, question you might have is, where are we going from here? What's the next step? Well, we would like to see those of us who have been involved in this situation here in San Mateo County is to get residents, especially homeowners groups, uh, to be able to organize throughout the county uh, we envision the possibility of an alliance of homeowner and resident associations that can work collectively. As you know, there are no boundaries in fire. You can't stop the boundary at one city uh, and into the next city. Uh, we have to look at this as a regional issue. So we'd like to see the residents be able to come together. There are also programs available. Uh, there's a national, actually an international program called um, FireWise, which has a couple of chapters, basically a small group could be a neighborhood watch group or a handful of residents on a street could create a firewise group. It's not real fancy organizational uh, structures, but there are uh, people from Cal Fire and from local fire departments here that can reach out to folks who want to organize. Uh, I see Dudley here. Uh, Dudley is from uh, Portola Valley Ranch, which has a firewise chapter, and they've been able to do things like collaborate on vegetation removal, uh, getting some grant monies, and, and basically uh, connecting people in a neighborhood. And so we have Neighborhood Watch. Now it's time to have Neighborhood Fire Watch and, and look at this kind of organization. So there are people that are willing to go out and meet with homeowner groups to talk to them about what they can do. So feel free to step up on that. The second thing is obviously we need to have a, a, a collective of all the stakeholders, that is cities, water departments, utilities, parks, special districts like open space districts and others to get together and come up with some, some standards. Um, we need building code standards. Uh, some of the greatest hazards that we have to wildfire here are sparked fires along the, the, the freeways like I-280. During the peak of the, of the fire season, we have as many, uh, I'm told, from Cal Fire as four sparked fires per week per week. All it takes is one of those in the middle of the night with high winds to go up the hill and there goes a good part of the peninsula. So um, we need to work collaboratively and we certainly need to look at building codes. There are places that are in the high ha hazard zone that are still allowing today cedar uh, wood shake roofing um, and, and we need to look at that very carefully. That's not something that, that should be going forward. Um, so. We're not out of harm's way just because we don't live in the hills. If we live in the flats, embers could fly two or three miles. Uh, it doesn't mean that, that, that people uh, in the lowlands are immune from the threats that could happen. So one thought that I've been thinking of, and I, I invite you to consider this, we have regional agencies that deal with water pollution and air pollution and coastal protection. Do we need to have a Bay Area regional agency to look at wildfire prevention and, and addressing the wildfire issue? Do we need to have one umbrella agency that can help the cities 
and the various agencies set standards and get these kinds of early warning systems and bring in the, the technology that's right at our doorstep. We have Silicon Valley here, and yet we haven't been engaging these new technologies that are out there. Um, would that be helpful? And I just throw that out as, as food for thought. Now we're going to jump into questions. Yes, uh, apart from the, uh, the video that we will have on, on a YouTube channel, the presentations from all the speakers will also be online uh, through the uh, Loma Prieta uh, CR Club chapter website. So you'll be able to get access to the presentations as well as to the video. Again, the more people that you can send this to and uh, engage in this process, uh, the more we can start to develop a more collective approach to safety here in the county. So. Um, with that, we're going to jump into some um, questions that we have here. And uh, uh, here's one question. Uh, we live in the hills of San Carlos on a cul-de-sac with many trees near power lines. We also have wood-sided homes with open eaves. How do we protect our homes? Um, Denise, maybe you want to try this one. So that's a great question. Um, I call the trees at overhanging power lines target hazards. And so part of my job as a fire marshal is to um, prevent ignitions. So um, you know, if it's predictable, it's preventable. If you have a tree and maybe PG&E says it's in compliance, um, and maybe it's in the town or city right away, or maybe it's your tree, if it's hanging over a power line, it has the potential for taking out the power line. So be proactive. Think about removing the tree. Uh, replant with something low, something that pg e recommends, something native, something, yeah, exactly, something low growing. Um, eaves, so I have a whole bunch of vents over here. Uh, I have something for your eaves, uh, enclosed eaves are recommended if you're uh, in SRA or in an unincorporated area or in a WUI area, you need to have enclosed eaves if you do new construction. So please come look at my sample table. I got another one for you, Denise. Uh, question is, is redwood siding actually more fire resistant than other woods? Also, are redwood stakes um, other than cedar, et cetera? Um, I didn't get the rest of that. Uh, and then a question about uh, with modern tar and gravel roofs, uh, is it really just paper without the gravel? Um, and our roofs are, are, are those kinds of roofs safer than shingles? So I think we're talking about redwood and tar and gravel roofing. Uh, okay, well, that's kind of a multi-pronged question. Um, nominal thickness of wood siding is probably going to determine its, its fire rating, uh, but it's the small little gaps uh, that's in your si siding or, or in your house. You could have a stucco house, and you could have some, you know, uh, some little gaps, and those are just uh, as vulnerable as having wood siding. So, but uh, wood siding all the way to the ground is definitely probably the most vulnerable because that's where the embers are going to land. Uh, that's where the leaf litter is. And um, so I had some good, I think, pictures of some skirting that potentially you can do or using some non-combustible material. I have something called hardy board over on my table and I believe a magazine. Um, it's half the cost. Um, it's very sturdy um, and you can paint it and it looks like wood. So please look at that, and I'm happy to ask uh, answer questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is. Okay. He said tar, tar and gravel roofs are considered non-combustible. What she said. So um, here's here's a good question, um, and maybe Dr. Clements. So a uh, question for Dr. Clements. Are Diablo winds different than Santa Ana winds?
Great, thank you. Um, another question, uh, if a neighbor's trees in their backyard are old pines, overgrown, not trimmed, what can the neighbor do about their concern uh, for fire danger? So um, maybe uh, Chief Cox. Yeah, this is a million dollar question that comes up quite a bit. The, uh, it depends where you live on defensible space inspection. So if you live in the unincorporated areas or the state responsibility areas, uh, you um, will most likely get a 100-foot defensible space inspection from uh, CAL FIRE. If you're in a local jurisdiction, uh, you may get an inspection by your local fire agency. You can always uh, report it to the fire agency. However, I would say approaching your neighbor first is the most um, civil and important thing to do. Um, if it comes to the fire agency, there's also unintended consequences that the fire department is probably going to check your property as well while they're there. Uh, and so you never want to uh, be calling someone else out if, if your property has issues as well. So I'd say first step is engage with your neighbors. Uh, second step, you can always refer to the fire department, but just understand that may have a bigger impact uh, uh, throughout the community. Um, but 100 defensible space is what we preach. It's what we uh, uh, inspect for. Uh, and it's the single biggest thing that somebody can do to ensure that they're, they're safe and their property has the highest chance of survival. Thanks. Thank you, Chief Cox. Uh, this would be a question for Brian, if he's still here. There he is. Um, a, a interesting question. Governments offer discounts for installing solar cells, or replacing old appliances, et cetera. So why not discounts and rebates for repairing roofs, siding, skylights, vents? Why not ban wood roofs with date by which all wood roofs and plastic skylights must be replaced? And if memory serves me right, isn't there some legislation percolating in Sacramento about um, extending some assistance to homeowners. That's right. This has actually been, I'm, I'm the most optimistic that I've been in a long time after this year. We've seen a, a whole suite of legislation and new ideas, um, new to the legislature, not new to the fire protection community, um, of finally coming up. Instead of the overwhelming focus just on how do we incentivize tree thinning projects, um, out in the Sierras, there is now this greater focus on how do we incentivize, how do we help to support, and often that means subsidize, the kinds of work that we're talking about here today. Not a lot of those made it through. It was, this was the first year we saw them um, introduced in the legislature, um, but the conversation has started. Budget issues are always um, more difficult and are going to take more than just one you know, cycle to get through. But yeah, we are now talking about how do we get money to the actual homeowners and the communities. Part of the problem has been that there isn't an overarching state agency that's able to reach right down into the homeowner level and the, and the local district as well as, or as easily as we've had um, the CAL FIRE that's been able to you know, move those large sums of money for the various um, forest thinning type projects. So that's a, it's an obstacle, but it's by no means one that we can't and won't um, overcome so that we can actually get the, get the work done where it needs to be done at people's houses and yards. So uh, a couple more questions for Brian. What does the state and state policy people say when you provide concrete evidence that deforestation will not protect communities from wildfires? Um, I actually, it depends on the group that I work with because uh, if I'm there with, uh, if it's a part of a CAL FIRE discussion where we're talking with the folks that are on the ground that, that deal with this, um, of course, they're seeing many of the same things that you heard me say, which is that we want it, we have these priorities um, that are necessary for our ability to fight fires and the ability of the houses and communities to be able to, to, um, to withstand those fires. Um, it, when it all gets mushed up and complicated or sometimes misdirected is at the is at the level where you're talking about overall state policy and the big blocks of money going through what is already um, an existing infrastructure or an existing system at, at, the, at the legislature. What they say is of course we all want the same thing. What the job of my job is with the Center for Biological Diversity, our allies with Sierra Club California, what we're in there right now is making sure voicing our concern, voicing our objective, which is for that money that's supposed to be going to protect 
people and communities from fire that we're going to see that money actually make it to those kinds of projects and not get wrapped up into the politics and not get wrapped up into the forest um, projects that aren't necessarily as directly and importantly um, directly important to um, to the protection so the fight continues Sierra Club is a major part of that and um, and we have to keep working on it uh, one more question. It was said that removing trees releases greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Does that apply to dead trees as well? Um, uh, of course, trees are made of wood, which is made out of carbon. Um, and, and that is something that we do want to keep in mind when we're thinking of forest restoration or, home fi or, or um, fuel break, the various forest thinning projects when we want to think of them in terms of climate projects. If you're, if you're proposing that we're going to be doing um, a bunch of thinning in the landscape in order to reduce fire because of, and you want to promote that because of the overall carbon benefits, well then we do need to take a look at the entire ledger of where all of the carbon flows are. What kind of emissions are coming from the work that we do, um, the emissions that go into doing that kind of thinning and all the emissions of course from from the trees that you are removing that are then being um, disposed of and, al and also the foregone sequestration of all the trees that would continue growing. But I would argue and do argue most of the work, maybe all of the work that we're doing, that we're promoting and, um, and supporting for protecting houses and communities, that should not be being done in the context of and only through the lens of a climate project. That should be do being done for public health and safety. And so we do want to draw that distinction, just don't want to be sold projects for on their climate basis if we haven't really done the work to do that calculation and analysis to make sure that that actually makes sense. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. April, I have a few questions for you. Um, here's one question. Is it more fiscally advantageous for PG&E to trim trees instead of protecting their wires? If not, why are they insistent on deforestation? Um, so the, the cover conductors are um, expensive. Um, one thing that you'll see if you take a look at my bigger presentation, um, interesting that SCE estimates, I think it's about $430,000 a mile um, for cover conductors, and PG&E is claiming about $1.6 million a mile. Um, so, uh, same, th that's, uh, it depends on who you talk to how expensive this is. Um, so, uh, yeah, the cover conductors cost more upfront than the vegetation management, um, but it's also something that requires uh, more planning, uh, more thought, um, you know, vegetation management for the most part is, um, you know, you've got Davy Tree, um, it's, you know, contractors. Um, so uh, it, it, if you mean cost in pure dollars, yes, vegetation management is uh, cheaper, but if you're looking at cost of society, um, covered conductors is definitely your much better option. Um, undergrounding is the most expensive, the safest, um, uh, the my preferred is let's have more local distributed power. Let's have um, power in every rooftops and let's need less lines. Um, so, yeah. uh, one more question. I, there are two questions that relate to the same thing, um, and that is uh, here, here's one question: How will high heat and highly flammable non-native trees such as eucalyptus um, be managed as part of a long-term wildfire management plan? And then people are also asking, are there trees that are better to plant uh, than um, that have less fire risk? And again, a reference to eucalyptus, which everybody knows is, is a very hazardous tree. Yeah, so um, something that PG&E has done and the other utilities are not is they've got this target on what they're calling the top 10 trees. Um, eucalyptus, I think, is, is one of those trees. But a lot of those, um, you know, there's oak trees, there's pine, those are you know, native trees. These are trees that they want to, they don't want anywhere near the power lines and they want the ability to just completely remove, um, which is, is uh, quite distressing. 
Um, <coughs> they do, if you go on PG&E's website, they will give you a list of uh, trees that they consider to be more um, fire friendly. Um, off the top of my head, I'm not sure if, uh, how many of those are natives. Um, but I think those are, it's going to be more like crepe myrtles, trees that are, are shorter and, um, and are, n are not so likely to fall over um, or to overhang. Um, so yeah, the, the top 10 trees, um, which account for 50% of all of the trees in um, PG&E's territory. Um, so that's, that's pretty disturbing. Thank you. So uh, here's a question for uh, Kevin. Here you go. Um, Text, phone, social media are dependent on electrical power. How will our emergency communication system work if there's no power for extended period, especially uh, with wildfire or earthquakes? Okay, so the one tried and true communication method that has withstood the test of time, ham radios. And we have a lot of very active amateur radio uh, um, programs. A lot of our CERT uh, community emergency response teams have amateur radio folks tied in with them. The fire departments have volunteers that would work with that. Our, our county's dispatch uh, background communications. So, so that route, there's other methods of radio communications that are not power dependent that we would utilize. And then good old fashioned telephone that wouldn't be impacted by the uh, electricity going out, uh, the plain old telephone system. And then, of course, we do have first responders that would go to the communities with PA systems, neighbors helping neighbors, that kind of aspect. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, so uh, one other uh, question here. This will be the last one. Um, uh, in regard to red flag warnings, uh, should there be some kind of restriction on uh, narrow winding roads in terms of parking, et cetera? Um, let's see, who could, who could answer this one? <laughs> that, that's a phenomenal question. Um, we had a recent meeting between law, fire, and all the other emergency services agencies, large landowners, uh, last month to talk about this exact issue, right? When there's a red flag warning, uh, there's actions that almost every agency needs to take or could take to uh, be more resilient. That goes from making sure water tanks are full in the water systems, that makes sure that um, uh, roadways are open uh, in high-risk areas and it means more firefighters are staffing and, and on lookouts for fire. So I think we're just starting to open the door as to what red flags mean and what they mean in response and preparation. Um, but it's on the radar um, and I definitely think you'll see some developments of that over the years to come. Thank you, Chief. Uh, just uh, one uh, there's a request um, on whether, and this is for Dan, um, there would be possible for uh, some of these people here to, to have a tour of the new 911 center. Now I can say that I had a tour of a couple of months ago while it was still in the construction phase. Uh, it will be a phenomenal place and, and is there going to be any kind of avenue for the public or public officials or neighborhood groups or anyone else to, to do tours? We think there will be, Ken, but we don't exactly know how that'll work because we're trying to find our target date to get in. We were actually supposed to be in a few months ago. It's generating a lot of interest, but I think contacting me or you in the coming months after we get up and running, we'll have some, some way to do that. Maybe not for everyone, but certainly we'll do it. But more details to come in the coming weeks. At the bottom of your agenda is a website. And that's where all these questions will be posted. There'll be answers to the ones that we were not able to answer today. I also have here, and you can see it outside, uh, another program of the Loma Prieta chapter, the Sierra Club, which are, is our environmental stewardship program. In its sixth year, it's about environmental issues that you can learn about over a period of about eight months. And there are people outside answering questions on that. So thank you all for coming, and we'll, we'll be doing another one of these shortly.